G'day, folks. It's your coach here. We're going to be talking about one of my personal favorite armies. If you've been new to the channel, you wouldn't know that Gloom Spike Gits have a special place in my heart. And we are talking not spiders. We're not talking squigs. We're not talking trogoths. We are talking about the best part in this book. It is the Gits. It is the Moon Clan Gits. And I thought there's no better person that could talk Gits with me than the sixth member, not of the Spice Girls, but of the Gobba Palooza, Luke Gooley. G'day, Luke. Hey, Coach. How are we going? I am good. Are you worth your points in the battalion? Because I can't justify it sometimes. Oh, mate, 110%. Every, every uh, competitive list I've ever done, with the exception of one or two for the Gobbos, have always had it in there. They are highly underrated, I think. They are. And we've talked a lot. Over time, we've list teched, and I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I hate the fact that I have to pay extra for the bloody battalion, and each of them are a single drop. But... Uh, you've done really well with the Git, so I thought it'd be great to bounce ideas and explain and kind of explore how does Git's 2020 look, uh, given that we've had changes, not, not to points, but we've had some fundamental changes with the amount of endless spells that we can take. Obviously, the meta has changed as well. So I want to, you know, Luke, you've been kind enough to send me two lists. So I want to learn not just about how you look at Git's today, but then how are you building around the 2020 version of Git? So um, thank you for coming. Anything that you want to say to the internets? Uh, don't underestimate the Gits. <laughs> um, no, I'm ready to jump in and really uh, let some people know the absolutely amazing uh, army that is the Gits and how uh, spamming 200 uh, Gits on the list can, uh, on a field can uh, really make the opponents uh, pull their hair out. <laughs> So I basically had like a love song ballot for three hours on a different channel for Agent Nagash. I got interviewed and I got asked, you know, why do you play Gits? And, you know, I absolutely shared all of my love about why this army is so great. But before I explain why I fell in love with the Gits, you know, why did you select this army and why is the, the Goblin version, the Gits version, the best version of this book? So I love the insanity and craziness of the uh, goblins. I always have. Um, it was one of my first uh, back in the old realms armies when I was 12 starting off. I really got down with uh, Skaven and uh, goblins. So that's a very big uh, leap from when you're uh, probably 12 getting into Warhammer, probably choosing one of the least uh, least consistent armies. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the old, uh, in the old world, when uh, they used to be a lot more random. They were crazy oh. random. Skaven were probably the most random <laughs> army. You, like you, you, you think about consistency of mortal wounds. Back in the day, Skaven was high risk, <laughs> high reward. There were so many times it would go against you. But even simple things like fanatics, they would start at the back of your army and they would actually kill your own dudes before they got oh. to the opponent. The best one was when you flung them out and you're like, yes, this is a great fling out. And then the next turn, they would double their movement and come straight back into your guys and just decimate two thirds your army. You're like, oh, well. <laughs> high risk, high reward. <laughs> That's it. Um, and, and they still have that same flavor. That's still understanding the zaniness, the uh, amazing little gobber that, that is uh, the, really the people's champion, trying hard in the in an entire mortal realms designed to beat you down. <laughs> they are probably one of the uh, smallest, tiniest, and unstrung uh, individually um, races in the entire mortal realm, and yet here they are playing with the big boys, smashing everyone down. Chugging a few uh, fungal brews with the boys and uh, going out crazy. That you know, for me, the what I what I got really excited about because I started a Gits army just before the Gits came out. So I started building a Moon Clan Grot army, uh, and I remember playing Liam. Liam was playing with his Sylvaneth with his you know 110 dryads minus one to hit as long as one of them was in with it was in range of the woods, and like despite. The, the the pure difference in strength of the army. I was just having so much fun eating a madcap mushroom, uh, you know, double casting. I was I've got squigs bouncing around the board. I have all these little grots coming around trying to stab people in the knees. And the fact that I can do damage with a net, like I'm literally throwing a net over somebody. Um, 
win, lose, or draw, it was a good laugh. Um, but, you know, like even when I look at things like Total War and I look at, um, you know, some of the characters in there and just the character, I think, in the gits, you know, the, the big noses, the mushrooms, the, the the extended features, the the robes, you know, even the robes are like little tatters and um, these little f- squeak features and, you know, all these different stuff like um, – like the spore squig that, you know, the fungoid has, like there's just so much character that um, this was a hobby army. And I can honestly say that in my 20 years of the hobby, Gits is my best painted army because it was just so much fun to paint. And this was before contrast paint. I painted 160 goblins with three coats of null oil to get the black gray depth Con- three, coats of, <laughs> three coats of non oil on 160 180 grots you could do that now with one coat of um of uh black templar um bloody contrast it's crazy isn't it yeah and you go back and you have a look at it and you, you get that shine and then you see contrast and you're like this was almost three hours of my life on 10 models <laughs> five but tell minutes. you what I don't regret it, and I no. still don't regret it. It's it's my favourite, best-painted army. Uh, if anyone playing at home can see, I've actually got a little plush toy mushroom there that uh, Dan Brewer in our club um, has his little play uh, rat. Uh, I thought, screw you, I need myself a uh, a plush toy mushroom, so I've got that there. But Gits, absolutely ma- massive fun. They are competitive. They're probably not at the top of the meta right now, but they do have a lot of answers to a lot of the armies that are running around. I think they still have a place in the meta. I think the way that we need to play with the gits has changed, though. No longer can we throw endless spells across the board and have five, six, seven endless spells running around causing mayhem. I think the way that we build our lists have changed, and I think the um, the new battle plans in General's Handbook 2020 probably complement us quite well, given that there's so many benefits of uh bonuses for battle line or bonuses for leaders yeah the battle line and leaders having the uh, ability because we can literally found, uh, field six heroes and four battle lines without a sweat going on there between uh, you know squeaks going up on the side and then you have your mass boys and our heroes are so cheap we can really double cap so many points um really easily in a good build list I think I'm pretty sure I, I usually run about five to six heroes. I, normally I've got, you know, four units of battle line and they're usually obviously minimum 20, but, you know, they can be as large as 60. So the the, the pure presence on the board, um, it's super easy to kind of own the board, kind of control where the objectives are going. And um, it's just generally fun. No, 100%. Uh, grots. Anything in the entire gun in the entire book for uh, Glimp Spike Gits is a massive amount of fun. There's not a single army in there that you can't put down on the field and just have a bit of crazy zaniness happen. And nothing pleases me more than co- giving a minus two, minus three, or minus four to my opponent hit. Obviously, six is still hit, but when I say you got a minus four, bitch, um, like I was like, like. I know it's redundant, but the fact that I can still be a minus four to hit and I'm doing damage with literally dudes with nets just makes me laugh. <laughs> my other favourite one is uh, um, attack last, attack last. Oh, yeah, my, my three units of fanatics are all attacking first before the first choice and just see if people go, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then fanatics doing absolutely nothing with the rolling five ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but then at the same time as well, I did play uh, Matt Davis, who uh, absolute gentleman. But uh, I killed with one unit of fanatics, Alariel and Durthu, uh, in back to back rounds in combat. Twenty seven hits against Alariel, twenty eight hits against Durthu. Uh, <laughs> like I, I just roll, I just rolled nothing but sixes. But uh, but then at the same time, there's been plenty of times where I've rolled like five hits. I think one thing that people need to be aware of with this book is it's random. When someone says to me, Anthony, what does your army do? I honestly look at them and say, I don't know. I said, sometimes they do awesome stuff. Sometimes they do literally nothing. I don't know which army has come to the table today, but know that this is the potential. And they're like, I don't know if he's trying to psych me out or like, or like he's legitimately doesn't know what he's doing because you don't know the bad moon that I don't, you know, we'll get into the rules in a second, but Everything, every plan that you have in this army, 
goes to rubbish. <laughs> and the same time, there's things that it does that just surprises you that you could have never, never planned, and your opponent thinks you're a tactical genius. But <laughs> you're like, hey, oh, I always plan that. hundred and ten percent having the moon on the center of the board three turns in a row. You're like, yeah, that was the plan. <laughs> Clearly the plan. Clearly the plan. Look, guys, where. I, if you're listening to this, uh, and I, I assume you are if you're listening to this, you can see how much Luke and I are just absolutely having a field day, reminiscing, laughing our ass off. It just shows you how cool this army is. So if if hobby enjoyment is, is your thing, uh, this army is definitely for you, and it is competitive. It does have some cool stuff. So I think maybe we should talk about the book, and you can explain to me um, from a Git's point of view, what are the strengths of the book that you see um, that, you know, for, for someone who's thinking about this army versus another army, like how does it stack up and where does it stack up as a strength? Um, it's a surprisingly strong combat army going through there. Uh, it used to be one of the strongest uh, magic metas out there. Unfortunately, because of the endless spells, new rules capping us at three and the uh, rise of Zench and soon Lumineth, um, we, we're definitely falling down the list in strength of magic, but that is something we uh, have to rise to a challenge to and really address how we're going. Um, shooting the grots it, it, as a whole actually probably are a lot better when it comes to dealing with shooter metas than uh, the rest of the guys out of the Gloom Spite Gits book. Um, we have a little bit of a couple tricks that can be really uh, beneficial to us in what's becoming the new meta that uh, I, I unfortunately feel that uh, the rest of the book is going to have a little bit of a struggle with. Um, but we'll get to that when we go into the lists. Uh, but more importantly, we have an amazing piece of terrain that is literally designed singly, in my point of view, for the Moon Clan boys. And uh, the moon itself, I mean, we, we probably benefit for being the moon clan uh, and being a Gits heavy army a lot more than anything else from the uh, in the entire codex. Yeah, I think the allegiance abilities rewards the goblins far more than the spiders, the squigs, or the trolls. So uh, obviously the good – I'll bring up the rules right now and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it. But fundamentally you got your allegiance abilities and – the good thing about the Gits is the allegiance ability. Um, I don't think it's complicated. So mm. there, there is one big, there's one big benefit you get, and there's this thing called a bad moon token. So basically, what happens is after the armies have set up, uh, but before you guys decide who goes first or basically kick off the first battle round, you essentially put down a little token. Um, and for anyone who's playing at home, I'll bring it up on the screen. But the token goes on one of the four um, corners of the board. And basically, from the start of Battle Round 2, the bad moon is going to go from one side of the board to another. You roll a dice. On a roll of a one, the, the, the moon doesn't move. On a two to a five, it moves one spot. So it moves into the, the, the center of the quadrant. So imagine your table is cut into four, not into sixes, into fours. It'll move one spot. If you roll a six, it'll move two spots. So basically there is one, two, three, three kind of spots on the table when you kind of think about going from one corner to the other. It's going to impact. Now, depending on what – depending on the build of your army will depend on the benefits that you get. So, um, Luke, before I get into the actual abilities, do you have any thoughts or anything you want to call out from a bad mood point of view? Um. There's a lot of different parts going on. So this can be a very random element in your army. Um, there's, I'm not going to lie, I've had two or three games where it's never even come on the field. <laughs> yeah, I, which can be... I, I, and I've done that with Scragrot a few times. So there's a the Scragrot, the Loon King, he is the hero. He, you know, one of his benefits is he controls the Bad Moon. There's been plenty of times where I have, um, and we'll talk about Scraggy in a second, but um, there's been plenty of times where you're right, I've gone to battle round two. I've rolled that dice. I've rolled a one. Then I roll a one again, and then I roll a one again. So the bad moon doesn't come into play until turn four or turn five. But then there's been plenty of times where it jumps two spots, stays in the center <laughs> of the board, and it just dominates for two, three rounds. So when I mentioned previously about the inconsistencies and the difficulty to plan your army, 
This is the first part. Literally, your allegiance ability is rocks or diamonds. And when it comes into the uh, the gits going up there, this is a really strong one. So if your general's under the light of bad moon, you automatically generate two command points instead of one, which can be massively strong on how these command points can work for your army. Um, the next big one is uh, enemy at the uh, re-rolling ones to hit under the light of the bad moon can be massive for a guard army. When you're having your poking spears and hitting on fives, re-rolling ones just becomes absolutely fantastic, uh, let alone having it for free without even having to spend a command point. It, it really can save you literally 10 dice from going from ones into hits yeah. when you're running through the unit of 60. So you think uh, about and, yeah, having a block of 60 or 40 goblins all getting re-roll ones to hit. Uh, that That is a huge amount of additional dice. And as you mentioned, you know, you don't have to spend a command point to do that. So um, that's a great little ability. And then lucky last one going for it, which is uh, probably one of the best ones in, in my opinion. Uh, well, actually, there's two, really. Yeah, I was going to say uh, there's two. I, I wasn't going to put Yeah. <laughs> so you got that bad magic. magic. Yeah, adding one to our casting for our own wizards and subtracting one from the enemy castings when they're under the light of the bad moon. So we've already mentioned Scargrot. He already has bonuses to casting, having another bonus on top of that one um, and also stopping your opponents from casting. It becomes a really um, tactical element and this is, I guess, what you're really going to have a look into when you're having a look at Grots. Um, it's all about tactics and timing. And for an army that is designed to misfire and miss time, it it's, can be a little bit tricky, but it can also be massively rewarding when it comes off for you. Um, there's the old saying, you know, eh, eh, for Gorka Morka, uh, brutally cunning or uh, cunningly brutal. Well, we are definitely brutally cunning in the drop ones coming up there. That's the strength that uh, really defines us when we're going through. And then you have, sorry, Coach, you were going to say? No, no, it's just, we, we got one final one, which is obviously the damage one, the Fangs of the Bad Moon. Yeah, which is uh, a beautiful uh, rolling under the amount of a unit to cause off some nice needed mortal wounds. Um, definitely not the hero snipe that uh, we wish it could be, but it can do some nice little chip damage when you're going through, or at least I find it doing really good chip damage. Yeah, so, so and, and just basically the way it works, team, is um, so as I mentioned, you split the board off into four. Let's say you put the bad, and you can put the bad moon starting in your opponent's territory and it essentially will kind of move over to you. Um, so basically when the bad moon is in the quadrant, um, anything that is in that quadrant is affected. So it either deals damage, it lets you re-roll the hit, gives you the extra command point, or it, it, um, it does something else, or minus one to cast. So depending on who's in the quadrant will depend on who gains the benefits. Um, if it's in the centre of the board, then it affects the whole table. So everyone's going to get the, ability, the, the benefit or, you know, you're going to be able to do some damage. So um, it is fun. It is inconsistent. You need to plan around it, but I would not, unlike the Deepkin, for example, where you really plan on, you know, the turn two or turn three, this is a nice little boot, a boost. I would not say this is something that I build into my strategy. Uh, it's it's a very random to be able to build into your strategy. When it works, it works. When it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, another point to tap off is uh, when this actually goes off, when you actually move the moon. So it's in between phases, uh, uh, between rounds. Um, Correct. Yeah. We, so, so it kicks off in the start of battle round two. So in, in battle round one, it has no effect. It, despite the token being on the table, it literally has no effect. And you roll this before you actually roll off your side dice to determine who has the first round, and that can make a big impact as well. Um, any, choosing... any strategy, any thoughts around how you play with the Bad Moon um, that our viewers might find valuable? When I'm doing my one, I, I, I have a look at the opponent and I really, if they've cornered themselves in the back and they're a wizard-heavy army, throw it in their back over there. If there's someone that's going to be really fast and in your face, you, you probably need it for a defensive line for yourself to give you the re-roll of ones. You just need to sum up what is the strength of your opponent's army and then decide who's going to need it more, you, you or uh, to help your own boys uh, under the light, or is it going to be better 
tweaking off your opponent? Is it going to be doing that little bit of chip damage? Is it going to be taking away from that uh, that cast that they're going to need to do that really um, strong level spell that you know they're ready to uh, throw at you? Just having that negative one can really change them in the second battle round and really uh, save your grots a couple lives. I know for me, I'm always planning on where I want the bad moon at the start of my deployment. So I want to make sure that I can tap into the additional command point because I, I want that to get a, I want to get a, a head start on my command points as quick as possible. So I'm always trying to think about which of my two corners do I want to prefer having the bad moon. And then um, I also want to think about who's going to gain the most benefit of that re-rolling ones to hit. So for me, I'm always thinking about it from a deployment point of view and I'll kind of put, put that, that, that heavy unit of grots, I'll have make sure my, my general is going to be in that quadrant to make maximum benefit the first couple of rounds. 100%. And also um, scenarios, you need to be really aware of scenarios when you're running through. I mean, having the bad moon follow the line of when you're having objectives, when you have it going horizontal across, it's just absolutely amazing when you're clicking over from uh, one corner to the next, the bad moon following over the tokens and just taking those objectives one after the other, being fully empowered by the light of the bad moon. Yeah, that's a really good, really good point. And one of the cool things as well as we get is we actually get a terrain piece. Yay! We actually get a terrain piece, unlike some of my, my other armies. I'm looking at you, Cities of Sigma. <laughs> you get this thing called the Loon Shrine. Now, Luke, tell me all about the Loon Shrine and why it is so great. Oh, uh, mate, 12% a uh, 12 inch bubble of battle shock immunity is a beautiful, great uh, little, uh, little bit of gravy on top of everything going up but what's really fantastic for me and especially playing gits is when you lose that unit of 60 uh grots going up there at the end of your uh, after your turn rolling a nice four plus and, and getting 30 of those boys back piling out of the uh, piling out of the loon shrine and i can tell you right now when you run a big unit of 60 and uh somebody finally kills that last grot and the sense of accomplishment that they have and you go oh yeah there's 30 more back onto the field. It, it, it can be really fun. Just go, oh. <laughs> there's my second objective coming back over there to recapture the objective that my grots were already holding. So with the bad moon, um, you set it up in your territory. So uh, it has to be in your territory. So you would usually do that once sides are chosen um, for obvious reasons. So it's not like, uh, let's say, the Bone Tide Nexus or it's not like the deep kin ships that can kind of go anywhere on the board. This happens in your deployment zone. Uh, anything that is gloom spike gets keyword. Um, so that is your trogs, that is your spiders, that is your squigs. Um, everything that's wholly within 12 of the gloom spike shrine, the bad moon shrine, is going to be immune to battle shock. Awesome. And then to, to what Luke said as well, the um, the stabbers and the shooters. So this is the goblins only. They come back at half strength. So a sixty unit can come back as a thirty. Um, that is one use only. So if I have a unit of sixty and then they become a unit of thirty, once that unit of thirty dies, doesn't mean they come back as a fifteen and then as seven. Um, once they're dead, they come back once. So if you have three or four units, it does mean on a four plus you're going to get half of them back. So um, if you think about again, you know. Luke and my build probably has about 100 to 140 goblins uh, on average on a four plus. They're coming back at half strength. So you're almost adding an extra, you know, maybe 50, 70 wounds um, to the table, depending on how you've built it, which is just pretty awesome. And especially when they're coming back, probably near your home objectives. And on top of that, you can say you use that, lose that 60 in turn one. Um, you fail your roll of that four plus. You can try again at the end of turn two. It is yeah. not a once only like you do have in the um, Stormcast for their special little one where they have the ability. And it's not a command point. It's a free straight off buff going out there that you're bringing up and having these boys back that you can try again and again until it works. And that happens at the end of your turn as well. So um, yeah. uh, it can be hard to balance sometimes. Um, 
I find it really beneficial if I get double turned. And if I get the double turn, which has been really beneficial, I can regenerate a unit of grots. And then there's a spell called the Hand of Gork where I can literally throw that that unit anywhere on the board uh, so long as it's away from my opponent nine inches. So being able to literally get a unit of 60 uh, back to a unit of 30 and then fling that unit of 30 or even flinging a unit of 10 or 15 um, that has secured me a whole bunch of games or at least cheap objective points right at the end in turn four, turn five, when most of the battlefield is destroyed and now, boom, I get a little sneaky teleport and these these 10 grots can claim an objective that it's just too hard to con control at the end of a game. No, 100%. And, you know, having that, even, as you said, 10 grots coming back from the unit of 20, pulling it down the backside and stopping a unit from being able to move too far because they've now got to deal with that 10. Or when you go in for the charge, just tapping in that one unit within the uh, uh, one unit so that the rear guard can't move forward after they've done combat and just pin them in, in objective points is amazingly strong. Once you uh, regenerate, by the way, it has to come back uh, within 12 inches of your Loon Shrine. So uh, just be mindful, making sure that your opponent doesn't get near um, near the, the – and it has to be three inches away from enemy. So if your enemy has surrounded the Loon Shrine and you can't get that three inches, um, you're not going to be able to bring that unit back. So be very protective and be very mindful to ensure that your opponent doesn't control the, loon shrine, the, the Bad Moon Loon Shrine. And um, another point, this is not a small piece of terrain either. So in, when you're in tournaments, when you have to put down pieces of terrain as well, you need to be a little bit cunning on how and where you're putting yourself in there because you still need to be um, within the terrain rules of uh, so when you're placing it down, um, which can be a little bit tricky in itself. Yeah. But yeah. Um, on the bright side, though, that 12-inch range, because it is so large, is a much larger bubble than it first appears when it, when you're putting it down like you can easily put two to three units of 60 i put three units of 60 entirely in this bubble with uh with uh commanders before and been completely battle shock immune and when you think about that's you know 180 plus grots being able to fit in this region that is pretty large area you can cover with it yeah no it, it is it is great um, and it's also good because you can you can hide your heroes in the first battle round. It's quite easy to kind of hide your heroes if you're worried about someone kind of, you know, KO, for example, coming down from the skies and just shooting off your heroes. You can hide your heroes behind that big wall of um, of the Loon Shrine and it'll just protect you for a little bit longer. So, And, hey, if, if, if they come down and kind of burn and eat your, um, your goblins, you're going to be immune to battle shock within 12 inches of it. So um, you're going to have a bit better of a response. No, 110%. Uh, I also like when I'm doing it. So when we're talking about the auras of the bad moon and being under the light of the moon, I try to measure out um, if I'm not uh, being objective focused with that one, where my 12 inch battle shock community lines up with the uh, quadrant as well. So I know exactly where my quadrant and the 12 inches uh, overlap. So I know uh, what's going to be affected by the bad moon and how I can keep the line of sight of being wholly within the light of the bad moon as I'm working through. Yeah, Does that make sense? Shout. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. It's, it's a good shout. A again, be, you will learn to play around with the bad moon. It, it takes time to kind of play around with it. But just know that it's, again, I kind of mentioned this already, don't build your strategy around it happening because uh, it's very so unlikely to happen the way you want it to happen most of the time. As, as soon as you build around it, you will never get it again. <laughs> no. Right. Even with Scrag, right? I mean, there's a bit more consistency, but certainly um, it's not perfect. No, well, that's it. You spend the command point for Scrag Rot going in there, and then you roll a two the next turn, and it's all already off the field. So speaking of Scrag Rot, you have been kind enough to share two lists with me. So um, I'm going to go through the list, and I'd love your thoughts around what you've built, why you've built it, talk through some of the choices, whether it's the spells, the artifacts, uh, talk me through just your general thinking because I think as it gets play out, you're probably looking at this going, um, why did he choose what he chose? Um, or, you know, it's not quite what I would build, but, you know, how do I take the best out of this list? So 
we'll start off. You are Gloom Spider Kids Allegiance, and you've decided to go from the realm of Akshi. What? Why? Why Akshi? Um, I'm going to be honest. I always, I, I generally always put Ashi going on there. I've uh, rebased my entire army when it came through in Ashi, so uh, they're good uh, from the old square bases. I've rebased probably about 380 grots uh, from uh, the old square bases into. I've got one right here. Right, Little, so it's a narrative. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a narrative reason. Narrative it's not, choice, all right, cool. Uh, look, in, in fairness, um, the, the new rules for the the um, the mortal realms aren't as strong as it used to be. Uh, well, actually did have some really cool endless spells, sorry, endless spells, uh, artifacts from malign portents, is it sorcery, yes. malign sorcery, but that's dead to us. We, we won't talk about that. Um, I think uh, you will find a lot of people um, doing the realm of shadow, though, and uh, I'll run through it in this one with it just because uh, the command ability coming in, the once-off game command ability, of being able to pull a unit wholly within 18 and then replace it within your general at the end of the movement phase, uh, using the Hand of Mork and then using that character that's transported into the Hand of Mork to pull up your 60 can be quite an interesting uh, effect when you get later on there, still having the command buffs. But we'll get into that with the Loon Yeah, let's later. get in, get into that. All right, so first off, <laughs> actually, no real reason why you've taken actually other than narrative, but... So that, which is okay. It means that other people can pick whichever realm that they want. So yep. you've got a couple of leaders to choose from here. So you first off, you've come out with four leaders. The first one is Scragrot. He is the Loon King. He is the general, and the and he's come out with the 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 hand of Gork. You've got um, two this, Loon. You've got two oops, Loon sorry, bosses. Yeah. No, that's okay. You got two Loon bosses. One with the artifact of the spite the spiteful prodder. The other one is the clammy cow. The final one you've got is the Madcap Shaman with the Moonface Moment uh, as the artifact. And then as the spell, you have the Great Green Spite. So we'll go to the top. Talk us about Scraggy, my absolute favorite uh, of the models. <laughs> Scraggy, that's how close we are. Um, Scraggy oh, is the general. Yeah, um, he is the general. And look, the reason he's the general going up there is uh, controlling of that moon. He, it is probably one of the best um, base command abilities that you're going to get, and you only get it if he is the general. Um, and that's really uh, either holding that moon into the centre part or if you're in desperate nudes, pulling that moon into the centre part in the between command phase can be absolutely essential in an army sometimes. Um, we were talking about, you know, never base your army around the moon because it's so random and it 100% is. This gives you a small little monicum of control over the moon um, for when you really need it. Um, and it can be, it's not going to change a game, but it can really help uh, create the impact of what you're trying to do and control when you're going out there. Of course, he has an amazing spell as well, uh, Nick It, Nick It. Uh, which destroying an enemy artifact, yeah, coming down there and just that that can be absolutely fantastic and amazing because there was uh, previously when you used to be able to choose realm artifacts, uh, destroying uh, a zombie dragon's ethereal amulet was always... Uh, I, I did that a month ago. Yeah. I did that just <laughs> over a month ago. I literally... Yeah, so basically with, um, with the War Scroll spell, uh, if you roll an eight from memory, uh, it does D3 mortal wounds. So it's like a, a powered up arcane bolt. However, if you roll a 10 plus, if the bearer has a uh, an, uh, an artifact of power, you essentially steal it and it's no longer in play. So the, the opponent cannot use it. So uh, what was formerly Griffith the Charm, Ethereal Amulet, Sword of Judgment, you know, all of the Ethereal uh, Thermal Rider Cloak, all of those big bad artifacts that you used to be able to choose, you could literally steal it off them and it was not available to the opponent. And uh, rolling that 10, and it was 10 plus, I think. So um, It's 10 plus, so the modifiers were still helping in effect. So Light of the Bad Moon, his own plus is going on there. It really became a 9, uh, 8 under the Light of the Bad Moon, put it near, near arcane terrain. You, there was a lot of tricks that you could really pull that number down and... Um, uh, make it kind of very consistent for a 10 plus uh, effect to go off and just really snipe out um, heroes because 18 inch range still got the beautiful distance going on there. The D3 mortal wounds, and as I said, the piece of resistance of just uh, pulling out that one controlling piece of artifact 
that uh, you'd be surprised how many armies actually design a hero requiring an artifact to really pump out their damage or uh, or control their uh, items around it, and it really helped. Um, and the next best thing, his beautiful staff. Ah, oh, the the, um, the moon on a stick. <laughs> the it moon is on the, the stick. it is the stupidest thing in the world because the range is twenty eight. 28 inches, and it's, it is it is honestly, um, do you remember the old bolt throwers, the goblin bolt throwers? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much the exact same profile as the so old goblin is... bolt throwers with an extra uh, two inches. So from memory, guys, uh, Scragrod has six m- moon on a stick attacks, hits on a three, wounds on a three, rend one for one damage. And then yep. at the end of the battle round, if the, the model doesn't die, continues to take a mortal wound at the end of every battle round. So not only does that happen from the range, that also happens from his close combat attack, which is also the exact name, uh, to bad moon on the sticker. <laughs> he literally so, has a wand <laughs> and the wand is just like, the, I think what gets me is the fact that the wand has a 28 inch attack. Uh, yeah. and then if it's under the bad moon, he's going to be rerolling once to hit as well. So, uh, Scraggy as a double caster, his long range threat, his spell casting abilities, uh, his four up uh, after save. He has a four up damage prevention role. Um, five six up wound, armor save. Five up <laughs> armor save. He is a super durable little goblin. Um, the double casting for me is the one that uh, it's the only way that we can really get double casting and getting casting. consistency with the plus one is just brilliant. Um, also, his uh, combat range is two inches, so even if you do start getting pressed in, you can still have him aligned behind the two inches of uh, two rows of goblins and still being able to do that attack and do that at a mortal wound at the end of combat is, uh, well, the end of the battle round for two wound items is uh, quite handy. Yeah, yeah. Anything else you'd add with Scragrot? Uh, I know some people don't like to take Scragrot because really to take advantage of it. Oh, he, he, he generates D3 command points on command a four points. plus. Which is your next big part going up there? So, command points is really the bread, bread and butter when you're having a look at uh, Grot Army. You, you're going to be uh, you're going to be generating them a lot, and you're either going to be using a lot when you're generating, or you're going to end up with like 16 at the end of the turn, uh, end of the game. And it all depends on how you're going to play and how things are progressing. Is at least what I find. Yeah, um, I, I usually find that um, I have about 12 command points at the end of the game unused. So. <laughs> Between, and I know you don't have it in this particular list, but between the Fungoid Cave Shaman, the Scragroth, the Loon King, the additional command points by being under the light of the Bad Moon, you often find that you're just burning through them. And it's going to be really handy, especially if you come up against the Lumineth, that are going to force you to use two command points for the price of one. You're going to, you're probably one of the few armies out there that has the ability to handle that and laugh at their face. Yeah, you're going to be going, okay, two command points. Cool, no problem. I've still got about eight up my sleeve and I was only intending to use three command points this turn, so I still have a bit spare one up my uh, sleeve for battle shot. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of CP generation in this army. Um, we'll move on next one to uh, Loon Boss. So this is probably one of my favourite command abilities in the entire game going up there. So it, it doesn't sound like much and it doesn't look like much when you're having a look at, but you select a unit wholly within um, 12, 12 inches. Yep, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that unit on a wound roll of six does a mortal wound. Um, that doesn't seem like mass of what you're doing, but when you have three uh, rows deep of 60 spear grots that, uh, and we'll get to them later on, that can really generate a lot of wounds really quickly. Um, it, it's a surprisingly large amount. Um, so, and, so the loot um, boss's command ability, you know, that's probably one of the biggest benefits there. So the command ability by doing mortal wounds on the wound roll, I think that's one thing as well. So a lot of time when you generate a mortal wound, it's on a hit roll of six. Correct. Get a lot of benefits to wound roll. So their their wound rolls go down quite significantly. So it's probably probably no surprise or there'd be no – it's not hard to be hitting on fives, wounding on twos. Um, that's yep. not a hard thing. And then you're generating mortal wounds on sixes to wound. Because they're so short, they're stabbing the kneecaps. Nobody expects it in the kneecaps. 
<laughs> I'd like some easier ways to hit, but the, the, the weight of attacks. Uh, so mortal wounds are coming out of the loon boss. You activate that wholly within 12 for memory. If your loon boss is your general, it extends the range to 24. So yes. that can be pretty awesome when you're doing it for it. Um, but in this list, how I've got it run up for the units, it, it's enough for when you're going up for just having that smaller range for it. Um, the Spriteful Prodder. Um, now, you used to see the Clammy Cow a lot um for artifacts but not many people used to throw the spiteful prodder in um that's just because look we were running in the golden age of artifacts um where you could take it from the mortal realms and there was such amazing artifacts that you could take that uh it kind of fell a little bit by the wayside and i think you'll find a lot of the um books that people are running through now uh, are really having to readdress how their lists work by having to choose artifacts from their book and having a look at little ones over there. And this pretty much goes off and works over um, having the amount of grots around you being able to attack a range attack and doing some damage going up for it. So at the start um, of the shooting phase, you pick one enemy unit within 18 inches of the bearer that's visible to them. Uh, then roll a dice for each grot uh, unit wholly within 12 of the bearer that has five or more models. For each five plus, that enemy suffers D3 mortal wounds. So if, if it's surrounded by a couple of smaller units or a couple of, you know, 12 inches is quite generous, you know, there's there's a chance that you could be doing D3, 2D3, maybe even 3DC if you're really lucky. So you have a look down that spore spatter fanatics that's going out there. That's your normal loon smasher fanatics. That's your uh, you big units of the boys coming up there. That's your snufflers going in there. You can really pile that up pretty pretty large when you're stacking out the amount. And when you're doing it and targeting a hero, that can actually be a nice couple little sniper shots going up there. And that's where Grots actually have a really good cunning point going up there. We we don't do a lot of mortal wounds, but there's a lot of items and a lot of spells and a lot of artifacts that can take out those smaller heroes or do a lot of chip damage going through there. And that can be quite uh, useful in an army that doesn't have much shooting. Um, we'll get to the Grots with the bows later on, but um, it, it really does help take out those key objective points. Um, next yeah, one over that, there. That's probably the one big weakness in the gits is the lack the lack of quality shooting. So, um, and we'll we'll talk a bit more about how we get around it. And probably one of the biggest impacts of losing the 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 endless spell spam that we did have, uh, because endless spells were at a time our equivalent of shooting damage. The Very other much artifact. So. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 we've got we've got to rethink about how we design our lists, which is why this is really interesting to to ch chat to you about this. The other artifact you've taken is a clammy cow. That's on the the other loon boss that you've got, and yep. that is uh, subtracting one from the hit rolls for attacks that um, target this bearer. So it's kind of like the old Griff feather charm, just without the movement benefits. And now you already have the loon boss has a negative one to hit, so this is now a stack two negative hit to anything that's targeting it. So and then if you're targeting for shooting uh, this hero, that's going to be a negative three if you're sticking behind the grots. So you're so, really stacking up. So Sorry. the war scroll already has a minus one to hit. Uh, then we've got the claiming cow, which gives you another minus one to hit. And then Luke's talking about the lookout, sir. So uh, assuming that the loon boss is going to be, you know, close to your, your gits units, um, there could be a minus three to, sh to, to shooting at this hero, which uh, is pretty tasty, or at least is going to get people to not, not waste their shooting attacks and might put them into your goblins instead. And that's what you really want because um, when, when when they've felt a large unit hit them with the mortal wounds, people tend to click on pretty quickly that I need to take out this guy. Um, range is normally one of the first uh, ways they try to work around it and when they realise that that's going to be a negative three to their shooting, uh, that that that's, uh, can be quite a hard uh, change in tactics that they have to tack on. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, um, f yeah. It, it's it, that's probably the other big glaring weakness in the gits is that a lot of their heroes are very low Small wound win. count. Like they're four yeah. wounds, six if you're lucky, but they're mostly around four wounds. Um, so, so if someone does get to the loon boss um, or to your your your, fun, your, your, your madcap shaman, it's not hard to kill them. I know when I played Doom and Darkness like 12, 18 months ago. He had the hex gorgeous skulls, and um, oh. they they do damage to wizards. And somehow I rolled two eights in uh, in the span of like 
oh. two turns. I rolled an eight one turn. I rolled an eight another turn. And that D3 damage was enough to pop all of my wizards. Um, so it just because just, just I've only got four wounds. So um, be mindful that that your, your heroes can die really quickly if they're not protected, whether it's through artifacts, whether it's, you know, distractions like Lookout Sir. Um, really keep Bubble that wrapping. in mind. Yeah, yeah, you've got to protect your heroes because they are squishy. Um, that's probably, yeah, as you said, one of the largest weaknesses. Anything that does the roll underneath the uh, uh, roll uh, above the wound characteristic to kill this model, I mean, it really hurts. Um, even Scargrot can be killed instantly with, um, with, yeah, the, uh, with the equals because he has six wounds. Yeah, he's, but he's the most survivable hero. Six wounds with a four, a four up after save. Um, but still, it's it, people when they see he's got the hand of Gork, that often is a target. Um, <laughs> when they hit, when, they, when you're doing attacks 28 inches long, uh, he becomes you know public enemy number one in a kid's army, especially because they want to shut down the hand of Gork. That that is the thing that people always want to know where hand of Gork is in my army, and they're always like, I'll, I'll play opponents and they will not unbind spells because they want to watch to see what I do with hand of Gork. It's always the one they're watching out for, and rightfully so, being able to teleport a unit wholly across the board, um, you really need to protect that one. And that brings you back with the shrine, because if you're really uh, um, cunning on how you do the shrine, you hide them behind the shrine going out there, outside of that 30-inch, uh, have them as one of your one of the last uh, characters you put down with the Hand of Mork, um, because you have such a large range on being able to select the unit, 24 inches with the Hand of Mork, Anything it's Gork, but I, it's Gork, okay. I'm Gork. Yeah, that's all right. I, I just don't want. I just don't want Gork to get angry at me. Gork and Morka? What, that's what's the old argument? It's more. Uh, it's Gork. No, it's Mork that's uh, cunning and wise. No. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not upsetting the gods. Uh, then you've got <laughs> the the Madcap Shaman. So that's a that's another spellcaster. You've got the Moonface Moment, which is probably the best artifact for the for the madcap shamans and then you've mm -hmm. taken the great green spite one of my personal favorite spells so talk me through why this compared to even like the fungoid cave shaman which is the other spell caster in the gits it comes down to saving your points um this is a 2000 point army and it when you're going into it, it it's a cheap shaman um that you have over there the moon it your heroes are going to be targeted and 10 points They've designed the lists really well. Um, I don't know about you, but I find I'm always 10 points short or uh, 20 points short of what I really want to do where you know you're going to be smashing it out. Um, for heroes and generals, I'm always finding that sometimes the cheaper option by saving 30 points between going with the Loon Boss versus going with the Loon Boss uh, with Squig can make a world of difference in my army where I'm saving those points for endless spells, um, for having it as the extra command point. And I find the Madcap Shaman um, being really good to be, as you kind of said, a throwaway unit. Um, with the Fungaloid Shamans, which are really awesome, generating the extra command point going up there, you have that extra save going through with it. I find people target them a hell of a lot more than I do with uh, throwing on three Madcap Shamans. They'll tendency to go for more for my Stabbers than going for a Madcap Shaman. Um, so the Moonface moment is really awesome in the fact that um, it's uh, pretty much an effect that goes at the start of the combat phase. You select an enemy unit within 12 inches and you subtract one from their armor safe characteristic. Um, from save rolls, sorry. So it's not from their actual, the wording is save rolls, not armor save. So it's not affecting their... Um, Armor class, so effects going through there, it's subtracting from their rolls. Um, it, it, it may sound like a little bit of a change in wording, but uh, when you have a look at ethereal uh, amulets going out there, it's you can't change their armor save. You're not affecting the, anything with ethereal's armor save, but you're affecting their rolls. So it actually counts against ethereal. And we know that rerolls happen before modifies as well. So. Also. Um, yeah, so, so for, for that as well. So, you know, it might be a four-plus armor save. I roll a dice, and if I happen to have re-rolls, um, you can't re-roll that four because even though it would fail, um, when you apply the minus one, the order of sequence so that re-rolls happen before modifiers, um, 
might sneak you in a few additional wounds, but uh, Moonface Momet uh, is such a great artifact compared to the other two that are specific for the uh, Madcap Shamans. Uh, I also love the Madcap Shamans um, uh, War Scroll spell. Uh, having that negative one to hit, I, I think going forward for uh, Grot players, uh, you're going to see a lot more Madcaps on there just having that negative one to hit against shooting attacks. Um, Again, throwing it on the loon boss, you have negative one to hit. You're throwing it against your stabbers. Uh, that's now 60 guys that are negative one to hit. And because it's going to be uh, having the uh, bad moon icon, they're going to have one plus to their saves against shooting. It's these little parts um, going forward, seeing the meta is changing a lot uh, towards shooting, that's going to help um, keep your boys alive a little bit longer and help kind of counteract the zinch, the KO, and the Lumineff that's coming forward. Correct me if I'm wrong, the Madcap Shaman also has a once per game mushroom that allows him to double cast. Is that, or am double I making cast? that up? Yeah. No, that is very much true. Fungaloid Shaman has the same thing, except for Madcap Shaman can kill himself by doing the double cast. Yeah, so it's if you, not if you as roll, safe. If you roll a double on the cast, it takes wounds. It, it, yep, yeah, it does D3 yeah. mortal wounds. And when you have. Such a small uh, wounded uh, model, uh, D3 mortal wounds, as you found out when you were saying earlier, can really make the difference. Especially um, if they've already chipped some wounds off your, your Madcap Shaman, which is four plus, uh, so four wounds. The spell that you've chosen is probably one of my favourites. You, you haven't got Itchy <laughs> Nuisance, but you've still taken the Great Green Spite. I, I love the even the idea of this. I'd love to watch it in a video game because it's just incredible. The Great Green Spite casts a casting value of seven. If successfully cast, pick one friendly Gloom Spite gets unit, wholly within 18 of the caster. And an enemy, wholly, sorry, an enemy within 24 inches of the caster and visible to them. All right, so we're, we're basing it off a unit that's within 18 and attacking someone within 24. The enemy unit suffers one mortal wound if the friendly unit has 10 models. D3 mortal wounds if it has 10 to 20 or D6 mortal wounds if it has more than 20? Um, it's it's under 10 is the one mortal wound. It, it's uh, fewer than 10. Uh, D3 mortal wounds if the unit has 10 to 20, and yeah, yeah. Six, D6 up there. And because you're running over here, a unit of 60, a unit of 40 going up there, it's very reliable getting off that. And this is, again, targeting off those heroes, doing those key pieces of damage to take them out there, uh, take the opposition um, unaware for heroes. And it's got such a beautiful long range going out there. Sniping off D6 mortal wounds from 24 inches, there's not that many uh, spells out there that really hits that impact. No, no, 20, hit, hitting someone 24 inches is quite rare. Um and you're probably consistently doing a D3 mortal wounds, if not consistently D6. So, um, so it, it's that's that's pretty good. Um, I, look, and obviously you've got the other spell, which is Itchy Nuisance. We might talk about that later because I think you might have it on another list. But Correct. Great Green Spite, especially with a goblin-based build, because you're going to have so many goblins on the board, I think the Great Green Spite is a great complement um, to a Gitz build. Especially this one coming up there. Uh, we'll get into it later, but that that's 60. Uh, well, we'll, we'll, get, to, get, to, we'll get to it now. Let's get to it now. Beautiful. So from, the, from a unit point of view, uh, you've got 60 stabbers, 40 stabbers, 20 shooters. So your stabbers have um, the 60 stabbers have, have yet. So the 60 stabbers has spears uh, with the shields. Your 40 stabbers has the, the stabbers, so the swords. Um, with a sh with a shield, and obviously your shooters are the bows. Um, inside of that, you've got your three nets for every twenty. So, the sixty units sixty unit has nine netters. The forty unit has six. Uh, so that that's probably another good call out team here. Is that um, for every twenty of your uh, your gits, your stabbers, you can have up to three netters. And then you can choose either a, a bad moon, so the the yeah, the the moon clan flag, or the bad moon icon. So you've gone in and taken basically uh, one of each in in most of these lists. Whew, there's a lot of choices here. Talk to me about <laughs> talk to me about the build. So tell me, I guess why why sixty, why forty, why twenty, why one spears, one stabbers. Um, you know why have you got more moon clan flags as opposed to icons? 
And then finally, why do you have a unit of shooters as opposed to stabbers? So I guess, you know, gits being gits, there's a lot of commonality, but like what's the logic behind your decisions? Okay, so the unit of 60s, I, I try to always run my 60s as the uh, poking spears. Um, a lot of people would argue which is better between stabbers and spears. Um, in 40, I think the stabbers are 100% the choice. Um, in 60, I feel it is the spears um, because you can run three three pretty much uh, uh, lines of the um, poking spears um, because they have the two inch range over there and really get max of effect. Uh, the difference between the stabbers and the poking spears is your know, poking spears are going to be wounding on fives. Uh, well, sorry, hitting on fives, not wounding, and your um, stabbers are going to be doing fours. Um, that doesn't sound like a big difference, but it is a massive difference when you're rolling so many dice, you really end up seeing the difference between the two. Um, fours are definitely. Uh, the preference going in there, but having that extra row, that can be the difference if, if you've uh, laid your boys out right, that can be the difference between getting um, 40 attacks in to getting 60. Because there's been plenty of times where I've gotten all 60 poking spears in where uh, it, with that extra two inch that I would have been missing if I had taken in the stabbers. Um, and when you're doing, you know, Sneaky stuffs. Um, we'll get into the uh, Gobba Palooza a little bit later, which I love running. Um, but when you're using a command point on them, re-rolling hits to one or under the light of the bad moon, um, that can become a massive just by sheer number weight coming through into the dice. Yeah, um, so the, the, the goblins have one attack each, except for the netters. The netters have three attacks each. Uh, I'll draw a line in the sand and I'll say that I like the stabbers over the spears. Even in a unit of 60, if I had my time again, I would build them as stabbers. I just like the consistency of the fours. Um, but when you did the maths, I'm sure that they average out approximately the same. Um, obviously, the two inches is certainly beneficial with the spears, but hitting on fives as opposed to hitting on fours, I'm, I am I personally prefer more of the consistency, but um, it, it's it's the ongoing debate that I don't think anyone's right. Uh, it's pers personal preference. It, it really is. At the end of the day, the two inches uh, becomes it, it's something so crazy stupid <laughs> between the two, but you're right. Maths-wise, it ends out about the same. Um, two inches being able to stab behind someone too to sneak out those couple ones against the hero versus the one inches, but... At the end of the day, it really does come, as you said, personal preference going into it. I like the big stab, uh, stab unit uh, of 60s having those focus steers. Um, now, the next bread and butter, the beautiful barb nets. I know these are one of your favourite parts as we were talking about This is about the reason earlier. I take grogs. This is the reason <laughs> I take if I If I could take a unit of 60 all with nets, I would take every net um, and just run around netting my opponent. But... <laughs> Uh, nets, <laughs> nets, nets are a, an, uh, they are an underappreciated but very feared model. Tell me why. Okay, so they've got the two inches as well uh, going out there that the uh, poking spears do. They do three attacks. They hit on fours and wound on fives. Now, that doesn't sound really great on uh, at fours to hit. Fantastic, wounding on fives, but you got to remember, and I don't think we've covered this one yet going up there, backstabbing mob. So you, you add one to the wound rolls if you have more than 20 models. You add two to the wound rolls if you have more than 40 models going up there. So uh, what that ends... Isn't it, isn't it 15 oh, 30. and 30? 15 um, and 30. Is it 15 and 30? I think I'm actually sure you're right. 15 it and 30. Is. No, I think you're 100% right. It's 15 and 30 because that's right. You have to move my uh, poking spears down to half strength. What that ends up doing is your wound rolls for your nets turns into threes. Your wound rolls for your poking spears and your stabbers uh, turn down to twos. So if you're hitting, like, so on average, like a big unit of stabbers is most likely hitting on fives, wounding on twos. Your swords are hitting, you know, hitting on fours, hitting on wounding, fours. On, wounding on twos. Your netters are hitting on fours, wounding fours, on threes. Threes. So, you're really coming up there. And then the icing on the cake, any model within two inches of a net arc gets negative one to their hit. So, um, and that is abs in the combat phase, I should say, just before yeah. somebody not, goes not in, Not there. in shooting, it's in combat. Mm -hmm. um, and just having that negative one can really save your army going out there. 
Um, changing a three to a four doesn't sound like a big deal, but it makes a massive difference when you're running through. Um, most difficult part is uh, wisely pacing your um, barb nets and really controlling your front lines going out there. So making sure that the overlapping two inches, so you're getting maximum effect in your oppositions and really covering that negative one is really your bread and butter. Um, if you don't have movement trays, invest in it. It is going to be one, because you're dealing with uh, such large units and models, it will save you hours of your life moving models around. But two, it will give you that extra little bit of control on how and where you're placing those barb nets. Yeah, I always I always make sure when I'm deploying, especially um, when I deploy for the first time, I, I, I very much check where my netters are. And I think from memory, like if I think about the maths, it is a netter, then it might be three or four regular goblins and then another netter because it's two inches circumference around that goblin. So that should be enough to have netter, goblin, 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 goblin netter. netter. It's either three or four in between. Um, and that should basically cover the whole, you know, if you if you follow that pattern, you will be basically anything that comes within combat range um, will be minus one to hit. I tend to see not to have the third one. You can, but that's just because my movement trays are slightly larger and has that base on there. And also uh, I'm getting the, um, if I have that less person in between, my two inch range is, if I'm bursting something that has a two inch attack range in itself, is grabbing that extra guy in between because otherwise you will miss the extra two inch person around when you have the three out there. Does that I'll, make sense? I'll always have them on the ends. I'll, I'll <laughs> if, if you know, even if I've only got three, I'll have them on the ends as well. So if I do get um, tagged on the side or someone kind of teleports yeah. or, or flanks me, I've, I've got a net protecting myself on the flank. So, so this is, um, we'll probably, that's probably both of them going up there. We'll go into the bad, at the bad moon icon. So I've touched on it briefly beforehand. It's giving you one plus to your um, save against shooting attacks. Um, Considering that you normally have a six plus armor save, um, then you have a five plus if you have more than ten models, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. I think it's um, ten. And then you, yeah, and then you have uh, an extra save on that becomes a four plus against shooting, which is actually quite handy um, for a grot anyway. I think um, four, four four plus against shooting uh, is very generous from what you and then again think about you've got a unit of up to sixty. Um, that is very generous. You wouldn't think about that. So, um, and then you put them into some terrain. You get the save over that one. Can be really handy against shooting again if you're holding down an objective and triggering around it. And then the bad, then the bad, then the other. The flag gives you a plus one bravery. No, what is it? One, no, no, that's a hundred percent one yeah. plus one bravery. Um, you got a bravery of four, so um, you haven't got the world's greatest bravery. Um, when you look at 60 stabbers, the larger numbers give you that boost for one plus bravery for every 10 models from Battleshock. Um, but that one plus uh, bravery moon flag really turns five plus six going into it to 11 bravery. Um, when you're having, again, that large number of boys, negative one to the shooting, you're trying to keep the number to keep your bravery up and you're going to find that that's... Bravery bombs can hurt you a lot. Having that one plus to your braver uh, to your bravery characteristic can try to really subdue against a lot of the bravery bombs going out there because that can hurt really bad really quickly. Something that I haven't run, but I've started to see uh, a bit of oh oh, I had this in the back of my mind that I wanted to raise and I almost forgot about it. Um, a little trick that Donal Taylor, the the loon boss himself over in the UK, taught me. <laughs> Uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, so what he likes to do, and, I, and I've stole it now as my own, is um, with the netters, you can make the unit champion a netter. So <laughs> With the one plus the hit? <laughs> so the net, so your, your unit champion gets plus one to hit. So if you do that on the uh, the unit champion, who can be a netter, doesn't say which particular model it is, uh, you can actually uh, make it easier because they get three attacks per netter, right? Um, and when we start triggering the mortal wounds, uh, all of a sudden that, that could be more mortal wounds. So uh, I, I do like that little trick. Thank you, Donal. Uh, before I forget, 
The other no, one we talked about was the shooting. Um, so I haven't run the shooters. One, I don't have the models. I got I, I hit my wall when it came to painting 160, 180 grots. <laughs> one of the benefits of the shooting is that they are cheaper. They're slightly cheaper than the regular grots. I was never impressed with their shooting attack. I don't think that they do a lot when it comes to shooting. Am I am I reading it wrong, or are you taking it because they are a little bit cheaper for the bodies compared to regular grots? Literally taking it for the cheaper for the bodies. Um, trying to do this because this is a uh, two drop. Trying to have a uh, two drop in a grot army is crazy. Um, and it, it, there's some really cool little parts in the battalions, and we'll get into that. But trying to fit this many bodies into the two thousand points it is hard to get it through uh as uh, as a whole unit and that little bit of cheaper saves you a lot of places going up there um again we were talking about earlier having that uh, having that 30 extra points makes a huge difference um and this is where it's coming back at um the shooting is not great it's not great honestly it's probably one of the worst shooting in the entire um uh, mortal realms um, five's the hit, five's the wound, 16 inches. Um, you're getting one plus to the hit roll if you have more than 15, so you're hitting on fours. You, you're not, you, yeah, you're, you're not you, taking it because they are amazing shooters. It's not shoot cast for grots. You are taking it because it's a little bit cheaper. They're good to hold a back objective. You do get your three nets. Um but There, there taking, are objective holders that chip yeah. that small one or two damage because you're not you're not going to kill four or five models with this. You're not even going to kill four or five um, Empire handgunners with this in a, in a shooting rhyme, or at least Cities my of, experience. Cities of Sigma. Sorry, yep, Cities of Sigma. I, 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 can't, I can't let you get through that one. All right, cool. So you're taking the shooters because they are cheap, cheaper bodies. Uh, you do get your three netters. Uh, they obviously fit in the battalion. Um, they're okay, but you're not taking them for damage. You know, they, they're just they're they're there for chip damage at best. Uh, they're not they're not going to be changing the 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 game. Um, you hundred percent not changing the game really, but they're that little cheaper unit. There's still still some fun tricks that you can use. Um, you know, throwing loon smash and fanatics. Nobody ever expects it to be in shooters or sneaky snufflers, but we'll get into that when we get a little bit further on. Well, let, let's get into it right now. You've got six sneaky snufflers, six sneaky snufflers, five sports splatter fanatics, five loon smasher fanatics, five loon smasher fanatics, all wrapped up in a nice little double bow. So if anyone was playing at home and they noticed that we had a couple of extra artifacts and he was wondering how did someone get three artifacts, it's because we were running the skull, the, the skull mob horde. And the Moon Skull. Clan scrap. Yep. So Skull Mob Horde going up there. Three of your um, pretty much stabbers or shooters in any combination, um, plus uh, three fanatics in any combination. Um, what this allows you to do is on your four plus, instead of bringing the unit back at half strength, it comes back at full strength. So, so that unit of 60 doesn't come back as 30, it comes back as 60. So you can literally throw with the hand of Mork that full unit of 60 uh, straight into someone's face, turn one. Gork. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Gork. All right. Same so, I, all I, the time. Got it. <laughs> but yeah, you've got your 60. You can bring it back as another unit of 60. So that's that's pretty insane. Obviously, one, you're reducing your drops. Two, you're getting the extra commander point and the artifact. But three, you're now going to be able to replace a whole lot of bodies. So um, that's brutal. That is absolutely crazy. Um, and then one of the next tricks you can do it is you can throw the uh, Loon Smasher Fanatics out of that unit when you hand and mock it, and we'll get that'll be a good segue going into the Loon Smasher Fanatics. So these are probably the Fanatics have always been one of my favourite units from get go, start point one, first couple of days uh, of uh, Warhammer. I've always been drawn into the uh, Fanatics guys that have been throw. Uh, literally force-fed uh, fungal brew, um, gone completely insane and then attached to a massive uh, steel boulder with spikes and flung out into the enemies. Just uh, going for gold is absolutely amazing. And these boys are ridiculously brutal. Um, but like any good grot, it is so swing. It is uh, 
I have many times, because uh, it's a D6 attacks going out for it, um, that's uh, hitting on fours, uh, three to wounds, neg two doing three damage. Um, but that D6 can be a real killer and so can the D3 damage. So many times five boys flung out, I've had five attacks. I've also had the flip side of that many times. Five boys go out, 30 attacks. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna rewind here for a second, just for just for again the, the folks who are playing at home and they uh, might not be familiar with the rules. So Luke's talking about the Loon Smasher fanatics because the sports the spore splatter fanatics and the Loon Smasher fanatics, while they sound similar, act very different. So the Loon Smasher fanatics sit you you put them in a unit of five or more grots. So you can't hide them in a character. You might hide them in your grots. You might hide them in the sneaky snufflers. You, you, you essentially hide them in a unit. Now, um, when you hide them, you must you must declare somehow. They, they are secret to your opponent, but they are meant to hide in a particular unit. So what I like to do is in my little battle journal, I'll write down which unit. It might be because uh, all of my grots have different colored hats. They've got a red, a blue, and a purple. So I'll write red, purple. So if my opponent thinks I'm cheating, I can go, no, actually here, here is where I wrote red and purple, like uh, some type of unit identifier. Um, that's, again, for, uh, why I've gone 60, 40, 20. It's also good to do it in there. And my sneaky snufflers, I painted the squigs different colours as well for the exact same part. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, so, someone who's more casual might not care, but at a tournament, for example, where, where oh, you know, a, a, a game could be on the line, you want to declare somehow so you can prove to your opponent or maybe call a tournament organizer over just to tell them where that fanatic is so you don't have a feel bad moment. Um, uh, 100%. And I, I believe the book actually tells you it must be written down at the beginning of the battle through de uh, deployment um, when it's coming out there. So these guys can pop out at the, at the beginning of any charge phase. Uh, yours or the opponent's. It, they act, however, very differently between the two. So if they're... In your uh, in your charge phase, they yes. pop out within three inches of the parent unit. Uh, the parent unit still must be able to charge itself, so you can't run these boys command point for getting your full six inch run and then go cool. I'm three inch, uh, um, six inches away, three inches out. Here we go with my charge. Um, they must be eligible to charge the self of the parent unit, um, but. When you're using Hand of Mork, that's nine inches away for the unit. You pop these out three inches. That's now become a six-inch charge, uh, which is, statistically speaking, right up the alley for charging. Um, it's it just over 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, if, however, it's in the opponent's charge phase, you pop them out just within the three inches out. And this can be an amazing, because the next rule, Strike First, can be an amazing uh, deterrent in keeping a hero. Like I've, I've popped out fanatics beforehand within three inches to cover around a hero that I knew was about to get charged in the next turn um, to amazing effect uh, to stopping them from doing up there and still keeping an objective. Um, there's so many really cunning little ideas that you can make out with the fanatics. It, it it's, uh, can really change a game on how you use them. Um, they are a one-time only pop out. So if you do return that unit of 60s and then you've hid the fanatics in it, those fanatics are not coming back. Um, you also you also couldn't hide those two units of five fanatics in the unit of 60 and then only release one of them and kind of keep the other one for the next turn. If a unit right. if, if fanatics are here hiding in a unit and you put multiple units, they they come out at the same time. But so if you're going to take doubles, you probably want to separate them at minimum. Very, very true. Um, they have got the splat rule, however, um, because their their charge roll and their movement is a D6. If you roll a double on a D6, they do cause mortal wounds. If you fail a charge, uh, they do a whole bunch of mortal wounds around you. Um, so it is, if I'm not mistaken, um, you still... Yeah, well, you roll the double, but um, if the charge still happens, you move them and then the wounds affect off. So they suffer mortal wound and any unit within one inch suffers D3 mortal wounds, which actually can be quite nice when you go, yeah, it's not too bad suffering a mortal wound for yourself or when you uh, can choose one, uh, an enemy within three inches and you've got three heroes, all three heroes are going to get D3 
mortal wounds is kind of nice. Um, but that can also affect your own unit too if they're within one inch and deal D3 mortal wounds to yours on a failed charge if you roll the double ones. So that can be a really interesting. Um, and then, as I said, you're going into combat, one inch, D6 attacks, hitting on fours, uh, threes to wound, neg two, D3 damage. These boys can really pump out the damage. Um, I, you were telling me earlier about uh, Alariel. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I, I, in one particular game, yeah, um, I mean, and this has happened many times, uh, that this unit of 40 Loon Smasher fanatics, they uh, pop out of a unit, so you've got to have them inside of three inches of your unit, outside of three inches of your opponent's unit. Right. So you can't put them straight into combat. There must be a charge. Anyway, yeah, they charged into a Lariel. Um, of the 5d6, I rolled 27 attacks. Um, they were under the light of the bad moon, so they got to re-roll once to hit. They basically put out about 30 damage at the end, so Alariel dead. Um, I then got the double turn, so then those fanatics uh, moved into Durthu, uh, killed Durthu, um, and then I think they might have gone into some Kurnoth Hunters but ended up dying against the Kurnoth Hunters. But um, for 140 points, they can do absolutely amazing things, but then they can also roll... Uh, six five ones and you fail those hits and you've just wasted 140 points so uh, any way you can hide them have them under the light of the bad moon uh, re-roll the charge or re-roll ones to hit with a command point uh, any way you can buff these fanatics uh, they're worth their weight in gold and they are a deterrent people have been scared to charge me because they've been concerned about they'll, they'll dance around trying to draw out the fanatics and they're like are you releasing them are you releasing them? Are you releasing them? Um, there was another example. I was talking to Two Plus Tough Doug the other day, and he was talking about Scarbrand doing all these mortal wounds. <laughs> I had um, I had Scarbrand unwounded go into a unit of sixty grots. He killed fifty four of them because he active in one round of combat. He did fifty four damage to the grots. I used a command point to um, to inspiring presence because I had my fanatics in there. They jumped out, destroyed Scarbrand. So. Um, they will absolutely save games, but again, high risk, high reward. So, um, do have those command points up your sleeve. Um, Bloon Smash Fanatics, once you release them, expect them to be dead, is my one point yeah. of yeah. <laughs> one point yeah. of that one going for it. Um, if they survive, gravy, you they they are paying for themselves, whatever. But um, very much timing comes into it, as you said. You didn't release them on the first one. You waited to yours and then triggered out there, so you, you knew you were having that attack first. That I, I, the, I had the same. Right. I had the same thing with Liam when uh, Grizzle Gore very first come out, and he attacked me. This is before the FAQ. He he put his his terror guys into me again. Same deal. Command point kept a couple of grots left. Those fanatics absolutely annihilated the Ghoul King on terror geist. Um, the Ren two is beautiful. It, it, you just got to look for consistency with those attacks. So any way you can buff that up um, is, is just critical. And you're right. It's about the moment. It's about picking the moment because they have no armor save. They have one wound. Literally, uh, if if a little bit of wind comes across the tabletop, they'll die. <laughs> so um, and, and, and they'll, they'll, your opponents will do anything possible to get rid of them. Arcane bolts, any of that crappy shooting, they just need oh, to get rid of them. 100%. So because. You can't leave them on the field once they're released because even if they roll a, roll a three inch for movement for the next turn, the turn after that, you, the randomness of them just makes them so deadly. The other fanatics you've got, so you've got two units of five of those. Um, the other yep. fanatics act a little bit differently. So these guys don't hide in a unit. They are actually deployed on the board. But they've got some cool stuff that comes along, Luke. What do they do? Um, I, I feel that these guys are going to be seen a lot more on the table board coming up with the change in the shift in the meta. Um, these guys, um, one of the best things that they do is actually um, give you one plus attack for your big units going over it. So any unit that has the moon clan and grot keyword, so sorry, squig boys, sorry, spiders, sorry, trolls, get one extra attack, um, which... When you have a look back at that unit of 60 spears, you're now doing 120 attacks. <laughs> um, and they have a bubble effect going out for it. Uh, it's a be another beautiful um, 12 inches, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just double-checking. Yep, 12 inches 
for Holy Within. And again, doesn't sound like a lot, but when you have a unit of five, you're spacing those out, that's a five inch bubble and then 12 around that, you can really um, cover a lot of models in your army, especially if you start off Holy Within your Loom Shrines um, uh, Battleshock Immunity range, you can pretty much first turn get everything in your army with an extra attack. So anyone who's doing a combat first strike against you is going to get a really nasty surprise pretty quickly. Um, the next big part, and this is what I think is really going to be helping uh, Grotz moving forward in the more shooter heavy and more magic heavy where we're not going to have that presence, is they're actually line of sight blockers. So... Any uh, visibility that tries to draw a line through the unit that's uh, more than one inch on either side or through it, uh, unless it has the fly keyword, uh, actually cannot see it. It counts as impassable terrain going out for it. Um, and this is really going to stop um, a lot of your shooting and a lot of damage. It tries to, to minimize that pick damage against your heroes going over yeah. from spells. Um, especially when you uh, use, if you go back up to the top guy over there, your madcap shaman with his negative one to hit, you're now having negative one to hit on those boys as well. You, you on a unit of 10 of those ones, that's going to be a big area of blocking line of sight. It's really going to help you. Um, it does block your line of sight going out as well, but when you're using uh, hand rock going up there, you're picking up the unit, you only need to see your unit within it. So when you're buffing your own guys, it's making some really smart tactical plays with these ones. It's probably going to um, be a big thing going forward um, for a lot of Grot players that are using Moon MoonClan Grots because they have a lot of tools coming up there. They are in no way, shape, or form uh, as heavy hitters as the um, Loon Smash and Fanatics in combat. They're a one-inch range, uh, D3, twos to hit, fours to wound, negative one, D3. Uh, as you said, the negative two for the Loon Smashes is, is really amazing. The negative one and the D3 attacks, they're going to hit, especially under the light of the Bad Moon, anything that they touch, but the wound is not great and the negative one means they're really not going to be smashing those heavy armoured units. They're good for your mid-range. They still have the attack first um, rule going out for it for Voiling Death. Um, they still have the splatter too, so when rolling doubles for their movement, and they are 2d6, one wound, six plus again. Um, so they are very splottery, um, but they are a really good buff unit and a really good um, uh, defense unit in the new coming me uh, meta having two units of Spore Spatter Fanatics tagged after each other behind one, so you have to shoot one to get to the second one. You can take a lot of units, a lot of uh, issues out coming out in the I, new current room. With the Spore Splatters, I never put them in front of the unit. I have them, you know, uh, behind a, a row of couple of gits, and I've got my heroes behind the, the Spore Splatter. So my heroes are moving up, being protected, but the spore splatters aren't protecting my grots because I don't care about the grots dying. Um, and what I find is uh, I often use them in combat once the, the battle is going against me. So they're able to kind of come around the flanks or come up the center and do damage to a unit that's been chipped away with the mortal wounds from the loon boss that have had, you know, a couple of rounds of combat with netters. Uh, they're, not, they're not the first point of call. My loon smashes are the ones that are going to do damage. The spore splatters are an afterthought because they are more buff pieces to my goblins and to protect some of those squishier heroes. So they're probably the, the two ways you should think about your, your spore splatter versus your loon smashers. 100%. Moon sla uh, uh, um, loon smashers are your, uh, your sword and your spore splatters are more your shield and your buffing unit. And that's literally how you have to think of them, as you said, Coach. The last unit you've got there, the Sneaky Snufflers, um, and there's a, a little trick that I want to share that I hope you might share in front, before me, but you've got two units of Sneaky Snufflers, so very similar to the Spore Splatters. They give an additional attack. The difference is, is they sacrifice their movement as opposed to the Loon Smashers that just do it automatically in the hero phase. Um, the Sneaky Snufflers, you have to do it to one unit while the Spore Splatter happens to everything within 12. 
On top of that, you can uh, affect a uh, two. Uh, you can affect the same unit more than once. From so both those sneaky snufflers can affect the same unit. Uh, they will take two d six mortal wounds, which can be quite harsh. Um, but when you're talking about sixty grots, now having four attacks, um, even if you lose twelve grots, they're making up for their weight number and attacks. But what these boys can be really amazing with is uh, giving the extra attack to the Loon Smasher Fanatics. Um, and that can be really uh, nice because you can pop them out of Sneaky Snufflers. Um, so, for example, if first turn Alpha Strike coming in, um, you uh, drop your Loon Smasher Fanatics out of your Sneaky Snufflers that are on the side of your army because you knew they were coming on the side of the board. Um, they fail, the opposite uh, opponent fails their charge or they've decided, you know what, I don't want to deal with the Loon Smash of Fanatics, come around next turn. Those sneaky snufflers are now adding one extra attack to those Loon Smash of Fanatics and you're now doing 2d6 plus one attack and really smashing through. Or Hand of Morking over onto the far side in the hope of a double turn, having them pop out in the... Uh, it, it, in that uh, phase going out there, you fail your charge or you're having it as a hiding piece to grab the objective and then second turn buffing the map and flinging them forward. The um, other the other little trick that I like to do, Luke, is um, so with the Sneaky Snufflers, you um, to get that plus one attack, you must sacrifice the unit's movement in order to give the plus one attack. And in are the you going to... Um, Sorry, you go. You go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. <laughs> Folks at home might not. So what you do in the first round of combat, or so the first battle round, maybe even the second battle round, is if you want to give plus one attacks to your um, to your goblins, it means they can't move. So what happens is your goblins are going to start moving up the board and you're going to lose track of them. So you can use the hand of Gork to teleport the sneak snufflers forward and then because um yeah you can they could yeah make the sacrifice so yeah um because then, the key wording because of the key wording of it when you do hand walk that unit may not move in the movement phase uh it doesn't say you're sacrificing your moves so you're not moving the sneaky snufflers you're choosing to forage instead and it doesn't count as a move so you're allowed to hand walk them up the top and then still use that ability to do the plusing uh, to grab that extra attack um, bit, a bit, a bit, a bit of keyword bingo happening there, but uh, a little trick that I like to do to avoid, and it actually, I, I find that my opponents get into this false sense of security. Like once I do my very first hand of gawk to a sneaky snuffler, they, they kind of let their guard down a little bit. Like, oh, I, I was expecting the the sixty the goblins 60. To teleport, and but I, I keep that up my sleeve for like round three, round four, uh, and then. By then, they've probably forgotten about it in the thick of the battle, and then um, they're like, oh. I'll, I'll be honest. After turn two, people kind of stop fearing the Hand of Mor uh, hand of Gork, in my opinion, going up there. I've yeah, had many ones after turn two. They're like, oh, stuff's in my face. It's all good. And there's so many sneaky things, like um, using Scargrot to teleport himself anywhere on the battlefield and then using his shooting attack to pick off heroes and adding extra wounds. And as soon as people start getting close teleporting them on the exact opposite side of the field. It's <laughs> people for some reason, never see that coming out there. They always uh, expecting you to uh, fling your next uh, large unit into their face. I once, uh, I once teleported my, uh, one of my wizards, which had, uh, and then I cast the Mork's Mighty Mushroom. And because it's a random movement, I was able to like throw the nuke in the middle of that person's army because I was able to move the, the wizard just outside of nine and then, get this perfect range. So uh, oh. there's, some, there's some sneaky little things you can do here, but this army comes in at a total of 2000 points. It comes in at 179 wounds. Um, pretty brutal when you think about that, it's going to be able to, and by the way, the additional uh, battalion is going to mean that any, any time that the bad moon is over um, is affecting the units, uh, which is essentially everything here, except for one unit. Um, they don't take battle shock. So basically his whole army is immune to battle shock while under the light of the bad moon while generating and, a whole bunch of additional command points in the process. And now you got to remember also Scargrot has that ability to control that bad moon once. So holding that center of the field. So you're having two rounds where the entire field is battle shock immune, or if you're holding into a corner and moving that moon to make it stay in that corner for you while you're becoming battle shock, 
uh, immune can be a massive difference when you're fighting off that uh, that damage coming up for it. We've just we've just kind of had a really detailed, and I appreciate the detail here. We've had a really detailed um, look at your first list, um, and I think one of the things that we needed to talk about was the um, there is a lot of nuanced rules and a lot of heavy synergy i've never played an army that has so much synergy and so many different rules so many ranges so many requirements to do buffs so i think this particular this list build while it's taking us a lot longer to go through the first one i think we need to kind of set those foundations because you know there's netters and there's barbs and you know there's spears and there's just so much going on but i think now we kind of get the idea this second list is going to take a whole lot. It's going to be a whole lot easier. Um, so for, again, people playing on the podcast, um, we've got Gloom Spike, Gitz Allegiance, starting off with Scrag, got the Loon King, same kit out. So it's the general uh, with the hand of Gork. We've so, got, yeah, sorry, you go. So this is uh, very similar to the first one going out there. Um, as you said, most of what we've already gone through, we've already gone through the large units uh, for the shooters and the stabbers, so that's all pretty much the same. Scargrot's still the general, still having that ability for the sneaky, the range attack coming up there. Madcap Shaman, this time I've taken um, Staff of Sneaky Stealing. Um, this is works a little bit different, and uh, I, I'll see if you pick up what I'm going to go down for it because I've caught a few people out with this before. So any uh, enemy wizard within 12 inches, add one plus to my casting. Any artifact within 12 inches also adds one plus to my casting. So under the light of the bad moon, that can stack up actually pretty quickly for a small little uh, madcap shaman. Um, okay. we'll, we'll get to the end and I'll see if you see it. Yeah, uh, all, right, all right, we get it. All right, cool, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's still the same. Itchy Nuisance, which we talked a little bit beforehand, uh, making an enemy unit attack last in the combat phase. Pretty much going out for it. Uh, it is 18 inch range, 12 inch. Uh, yeah, 18 inches, 18. So, yeah. um, so if, if if you do fight Slanesh, for example, um, if if it's you know itchy nuisance versus Slanesh's um, rules in Slanesh's turn, they'll still fight first. Um, so just keep that. It, it's going to depend on whose turn it is. But uh, making most people fight last is is pretty awesome, and it's only casting value of six. Um, loon boss with a uh, giant cave squeak, so very similar to the normal loon boss, has that negative one to uh, uh, to hit. Um, with the giant's cave squeak, it gives it a little bit of a bounce and a bite going through for it. Um, it has a ranged attack for the prodder, which is a 14 inch attack, d6, fours to hit, threes to wound, negative one, one damage, which for something that doesn't have a lot of rend in our army, having anything with a rend one for a range weapon attack is actually really nice. Um, and it also has, instead of doing, you know, three attacks, threes, threes, neg one, D3, uh, for its uh, attack that a loon boss does, it has two different profiles, the massive gorse wigs, which is four attack, fours and threes, neg one, D3, and then the actual grot has a two inch range with his stabber, which is four attacks, two uh, fours and threes, neg one, one damage. Um, having him, again, bubble wrapped, same kind of deal with the stabbers around of it beforehand, has the same command ability where it's doing those mortal wounds, it has a two-inch range, so you can put it behind two, uh, uh, two, uh, uh, two rows of the stabbers with poking spears, and it can still attack with its attack and have uh, a bit of a shooting range. Having Scargrod on one side and him on the other, just picking off a couple extra shooting attacks can really actually chip off some hero damage, which is nice. Um, We'll leave the um, we'll we'll leave the Gobblepalooza, which is the next part, just to the end a little bit because it has yeah. a bit to tr trickle down. Uh, we'll just cover uh, what we've uh, already. Before covered. we do that, I just I just want to just just to clarify here, team. Uh, that was a loon boss with a a um a squig, uh, yep. the giant cave squig, not the loon boss on a giant cave squig. So there's two different models that. It's the old Warhammer Fantasy model Skarsnick. So he's basically a goblin that's got like a squig on a chain. That is the go that is the loon boss with the new kit, the one that's that's riding that big, big squig. Uh, that is loon boss on, on. a giant massive, 
Big difference, Massive big difference, difference. That, you, that you may not know about because not a lot of people probably own the Loon Boss with a cave squig. Uh, no, really, really good distinction going up there, Coach, because uh, uh, I've yeah, seen just, a few people mix that just, up. Keep an eye out, team. Uh, so we do have uh, all all five of the uh, the Gobber Palooza, but Luke's asked us to to pause that one here. Uh, we've got sixty stabbers with poking spears, same kit out. Uh, Forty stabbers, um, they're stabbers. Um, we don't have that twenty stabbers. Instead, we have six squeak herd, uh, five spore splatter, ten loon smasher, five loon smasher. You've also got Mork's Mighty Mushroom and Chronomatic Cogs. So talk to me about everything else that isn't the uh, the Gobberpalooza, and then let's uh, let's let's open up presents at Christmas and let's talk about the Gobberpalooza. <laughs> My favourite boys. Um, so we already talked about how deadly five Loon Smasher fanatics. Uh, Ten Loon Smasher fanatics is uh, crazy. Um, but you'll find a lot of the uh, the death players out there, especially the new um, Bone Boys, really fear this unit after they've had 10 Loon Smasher Fanatics go into it. We all talk about how Petrifix really stuck in there with, the, uh, with that one plus. Uh, 10 Loon Smasher Fanatics. I, I had Petrifix players petrified uh, of having to deal with those 10 Loon Smasher Fanatics because... And, and now they've lost their crutch. Now it's not plus one, it's re-roll <laughs> one. So yeah. that'll be easier to chew through. Yeah, these, these boys will chew through a lot and very quickly going up for it. Um, even Zench players, uh, I've taken out a full unit of the good old Pink Horrors going out there, even with their spawning, because I've knocked out every one of the Pink Horrors so they couldn't actually summon anything for it because the unit still has to exist for it to pull off the others um, from that unit. Matic. And that's that's where I've found probably I used to not run the 10. I used to think the 10 was a bit overkill. And for a lot of armies, 10 Loon Smasher Fanatics is a major overkill. You, Your thoughts, Coach? Uh, in the current meta, I think it's currently an overkill. When Petrifix Elite and people are running around with lots of Mortec Guard, I think it was, it was needed. Maybe in the current meta, maybe not, but... If you want to delete a more crusher, a stone horn, Nagash running around, Archeon, um, there are still some really big hitters. So coming up against a big block of um uh so I've been talking to some mates recently about Black Kings and you know Nurgle getting a whole bunch of boosts. Uh Black Kings have a lot of wounds in them. That five fanatics won't do a lot against the Black Kings because they're like four wounds a piece, I think. B Ten. 10 will, will truly will, do will, will, yeah yeah so so they oh, yeah. they probably still a place but um i think maybe for a newer player don't go 10 because that's a lot of points to lose with a bad decision with a more experienced player i think 10 you will have a bit more control on who and where you release those fanatics because that's a lot of points the 300 points in fanatics that will again die with a stiff breeze very much so. Plus, you've got um, two extra units of fanatics, right? So you've got one one quarter of your army tied up in essentially twenty wounds. Yep. Uh, Spore flash with fanatics, as we were saying, plus one to the attacks going over there. The second wound flashes going up there. Uh, chromatic cogs. So we already talked about um, hand of book and how uh, strong that can be. Uh, chromatic cogs. Anyone that pretty much sees. 60 or 40 grots with 10 Loon Smasher Fanatics and a Chromatic Cogs will be dispelling that or at least attempting to dispel that first because that means that your um, Fanatics, when you fling that out, instead of now having a, a six inch charge, that's now a four, a four inch that they have, a four that they have to roll, which odds are becoming really, really nice when you're looking at that. So just reminding um, the folks at home, you teleport the unit of Grotz with the Hand of Gork nine inches away from the enemy. You then release the Fanatics that are within three inches. So there's now a six-inch difference. Um, and then with the Chronomatic Cogs, you get plus two to movement and plus two to charge. So while the Fanatics aren't moving, they're going to get plus two to their charge. So um, the six-inch charge becomes essentially a four-inch charge, which is 
like 80, 85% uh, success rate. So very, very, very durable. Um, now here's, here's where we're starting to have a little bit of fun with uh, Mork's Mighty Mushroom. So uh, Scargrot, first to spell, uh, attempts to put down the cog. And you, you know what? A lot of people will, um, instead of trying to get through um, the casting, for Hand of Mork, they will try to do cogs. I, I, I've played around with this. They'll um, take out cogs before they take out uh, Hand of Mork. They will use their Dispel to do that because they can see the synergy coming off and having cogs even without it means I don't have to cast it next turn and that's an extra nicket nicket. So you put that down, they use their Dispel or even sometimes their Instant Dispel because um, there is actually a few now that has the strong Instant Dispels going out there. Um, now you go to do your Hand of Orc and you actually choose against a strong spell army, you actually choose your Madcap Shaman to teleport. Um, with the, uh, the staff going over there and nine inches away where you have a 12 inch range for any hero or wiz any artifact or wizard adding one plus to your spell. See where I'm starting to go here? Yeah. <laughs> um, you place that down and um, poor Evie and, and uh, uh, her Cities of Sigma army in a Hella Heart and also a few uh, Zench players have found a nasty surprise when I have a 7 or a 6 plus casting, which I actually have gotten those numbers, to plus to my cast for Mork's Mighty Mushroom in their uh, weaker heroes straight up into the face doing that nice one out there which can be for a throwaway unit quite messy. And I think uh, against Lumineth coming up there where every champion ha now has the wizard keyword is going to uh, be a very viable strategy that can stack up pretty quickly. I'm not sold on Mork's Mighty Mushroom, but I'll be completely honest. Uh, I think for, for you know, if you think about the 90 points, right, I mean, that's, that is Everblaze Comet, that is um, the Skaven spell, um, the, the 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 vortex. Um, I, I'm thinking with 90 points. Person, my personal preference. I'd rather put that in the uh, the the bridge. I'd rather put soul scream bridge, and maybe teleport uh, that big unit of 60 grots with a loon boss um, up on front of the board, taking the hero with them uh, to to control the board, and you can probably take fanatics with them as well, right? So no, hundred percent. Um, so I think what I like about this as well is 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 if you're like me, you're like uh, I, I don't want the squeak herd, or I don't like the Mox Mighty Rush Room. You've got a really strong baseline here to kind of tweak it and make it your own. A hundred and ten percent. For me, I just found with Mox Mighty Rush Room that there was too many elite armies going around. If we if we were in a horde meta. I think there's a lot of value in Mork's Mighty Mushroom because you're doing a whole bunch of damage to people within eight inches of the mushroom. But because we've got all these ultra elite armies, I personally didn't get enough mortal wounds out to justify the 90 points. I would rather the the moon, the uh, the malevolent moon, or, going out there. or my personal favorite is the um the the scuttle scuttle tide. I never leave home without scuttle tide for 30 <laughs> points. The 30 points, uh, putting it and annoying people anywhere on the table, blocking movement, doing some chip damage for anyone that, that is either set up, ends a charge or ends a move within six inches of it. Um, the 30 points, for me, that's always been like, I, I will never write a list without um, Scuttle Tide. And if I could take it in my cities, I would take these spiders in my cities. Look, you're 100% right, but... I I've been finding, especially since uh, the last couple of armies going up there, there hasn't been as much elite armies coming through. I mean, you're always going to have uh, your Stormcast Eternals going up there. But the last couple of reach, City of Sigma, Zench, even KO, a lot of One Moon models starting to come through. Lumineth are the same ones going up there. I I was exactly like you. First time I saw the Mighty Mushroom, especially for the 90 points, I, I dismissed it for the Startle Tide. I dismissed it for a handful of very other items going up there. But I think moving forward, um, looking at where the meta is going, I think this is something that uh, has a lot more legs than it used to. Um, 
Do I think it's the be all end all? No. Could I easily take both of those endless spells or even just take the one endless spell, take that extra points for the Loon Smash and Fanatics and put uh, Mangler Squig into the army to do a lot of face damage um, that you can fling down? Definitely. Um, that's the beauty of how I've brought in the entire um, book, however, is you have so many options and you have such an amazing uh, units to go through. Um, well, I mean, for that 90 points, I could easily flip out for the exact same points, Geminids and um, and Scuttletide, or I could bring in the bridge, or for that 90 points, that could get me a Fungoid Cave Shaman and he's generating me additional command points. Command points. Um, yeah, so, so, so if you think about this, folks, um, you've got some foundations of what I think is going to be good in the new meta. Is this 5 and 0? Oh? No. I'm not going to lie to you. This is going to hit some hard, hard times. You might have, you know, we were talking offline about, you know, challenges maybe with like flamers or uh, salamanders. Um, you know, how do you handle magic when you've got uh, Lumineth and Seraphon and Zench? Zench. Um, you know, I, I talked earlier about my struggles against Hex Gorgeous Skulls. You know, I could pop <laughs> my, my, my heroes in seconds. The army is still good. Is it is it five and oh? No. Is it 0 and 5? No. I think for a competent player, you could easily do three to four wins. I, I, I don't I, I truly don't think that um I think if you're really good or if you're really lucky, you could go four and five wins. But I think it's at least a three to three win, maybe even a four win, depending on your matchups. Um still got the Gobba Palooza to go through too. We didn't talk about the Gobba Palooza. Talk to me about the Gobba Palooza. So I have never used it. Um, <laughs> I'm not solely convinced, but after talking to Luke many times, I have uh, my opinion is changing, and I'm actually keen to explore it. Uh, I'm not going to lie; I'm probably the one gob uh, the one goblin player in the entire world that's put his hand up. Go, no, I like the Gobble Palooza for its point. <laughs> see, for, <laughs> see, for me, like the, the the for me the struggle, and maybe this is the folks at home have the same struggles that I have is that it adds another five drops without the battalion. For, yeah. I, I would rather a web spinner shaman that gives me plus one to cast on that scuttle tide. I would rather, like for that 200 odd points, I just think there are so many other good, like a, a loon boss on Mangler Squeak. There's just so many cool things that I can do with that, that additional points. So for me, it's not that I don't like them. It's just that I've struggled to justify them in my lists. But you're going to do a counterpoint and explain to me why I should consider introducing the um, the Gobapalooza. So uh, I very much agree with you. If you if you want a low drop count, drops are probably not going to be your army. There's there's very few successful low drop count um, goblin armies that I've found. Um, and, and in in my opinion, once you get past six seven drops, it, it doesn't matter anymore. How many drops you have because they've either out dropped you or their army is designed not to go first anyway and kids, and kids don't really care about going first or second anyway i, no, I i've never not found, at I've never all. found as a kids player i care I, I couldn't care less i don't need and first turn i don't care if i get given first turn i've got stuff to do we're we're an army that excels especially when you're having a look at the moon clan gets with the large numbers we're a an army that excels turn two turn three that's where you're really making your effort and your money sure you got a good strike in first turn one to draw first blood um move your stuff around but that's 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 a show turn, that's the turn one for me is the board control turn one yeah. is board control it is take up and dominate as much as possible if you give me first turn cool i'm going to run and i'm going to swarm the objectives and then my nets are going to try to stop you from getting there if you take first turn Cool. Okay. I'm going to now try to swarm you back. You've moved closer. We're a destruction army. Moving closer against the destruction army. You don't, there's no bad point. And my <laughs> fanatics are coming out now. They're a little bit closer, but Gobblepalooza, come on, sell, sell me Gobblepalooza. Cool. All right. So there's a few, there's five awesome little characters. And this is what I think a lot of people uh, look at is, is they're complicated. That they are complicated. They've got a lot of rules that kind of come just into themselves. They've got a lot of things that kind of, uh, you have to really think about it and work in it because they they have a lot of different rules for each one of them. Each one of the five 
have different attack profiles, have different wound profiles, have different abilities going for it. So you really need to know these guys to make them work. Only, um, two, are, only two are a wizard. So of the five, two? Two are wizards. Yeah. Um, the Dispel and Dispel each. But we'll start off with uh, Scra uh, Scaremancer. So this is the boy with the moon sun face going over on the top of him, riding another, literally another grot that's holding a squig helmet underneath him, uh, a squig skull. He's holding is the, the squig skull. This is the one. Yep, the scaremonger over on yep. top. He's got the uh, scargle uh, face mask going up the top. Um, he actually does four attacks for a grot, fours and threes, neg one, d3 damage. He's actually really strong for a combat one for a grot. Um, four wounds, two, five plus. He's not got the hero keyword. So a lot of your little spells that target heroes and pops don't actually do damage to him. What he doesn't, however, get is um, look out, sir, but he has a rule built into him to subtract one as long as you're within three inches of a friendly moon clan. So he has a rule literally designed built into him to give him a look out, sir. Um, on top of that, in the first battle round, you actually add two to his save rolls. <laughs> and then the second battle round, he gets one plus one. one. Yeah, so anyone that's wanting to shoot him in the first two rounds, you're like, cool, okay, I, I, I have a better save. I, I'm actually a three plus save now, shooting at me, and I have a grot with a three plus save in the first battle round. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but what really makes him is the boogeyman, which is. Uh, select on a three plus, select a friendly uh, grot unit wholly within 18 inches of this unit. And it can reroll charge rolls or it can reroll run rolls. So, looking back to End of Morp, you've now got a unit that you've put onto this on a three plus. And if you have the battalion, if you have a battalion too, I'll quickly run. I haven't got it in there. Uh, it turns into a two plus, and my casters, as long as they're within nine inches of another person from the Gob of Loser, uh, gets one plus to their casting roll. Um, so you, so would, you would use that before you teleport? Yeah, you use this on the unit. You've already planned where, what unit's teleporting. You're already planning where it's yeah. going. So now you're having a re-roll your charge rolls on the unit that's teleporting. So yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm, like, of, I'm, I'm specifically yeah. calling out like you've got yeah, to do I'm this sorry. before. No, 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 yep. no. Not for you, Luke, but for, for the folks at home. <laughs> what you don't want to do is you don't want to teleport with the hand of Gork and then realize you're out of the 18, 18 inches of the scaremonger. So what you want to do is you want to do the scaremonger first because they've now got the buff, then you teleport them up and then it doesn't matter because they're out of range, but you've taken away the benefit because of the order is just in the hero phase. It's not the start, not the end. It's just hero phase. So I would do that order. Um, a good piece of advice for any GOT player is um, even if you're not using Gobba Plooza, um, always do your Hand of Mork as one of your last things, your last spells. Just make people use up everything else that they can for the dispels. Um, and unless you got line of sight, um, Gobba Palooza, I normally make sure because they are complicated. I, I kind of do all of their stuff because all of their stuff pretty much happens in the hero phase. It's one of the first things after I've generated my command points and done everything I have to do at the beginning. Um, just because it, it, it clicks over in my head far, uh, that way and uh, it, it means that you're not going to be transporting them halfway down the battlefield and go, oh, Jesus, I've forgotten to add the reroll charge or some of the other tricks coming up for it. Um, and they move just like all the other grots. They've got the five-inch movement, so they're good to bubble wrap around with the other heroes. Um, next one is Brugit. So Brugit is three wounds, so he's a less wound character than, well, again, not character, less wound model than uh, most of the others. He's got the same uh, two to his armor save in first round, uh, one to his armor second, same negative one to hit uh, if he's within three inches of a moon clan model with three or more model, a unit with three or more models. Um, but his special ability in the hero phase on a three plus, uh, pick a friendly moon clan grot, has to be grot, um, wholly within 18 inches, and you can reroll all hit rolls. So, not hit um, rolls this, of one, all hit rolls. Hit rolls. And this isn't a unit, it, it, it says uh, moon clan grot hero going up there. So, Scargrot, your stick now with three pluses are rerolling your uh, 28 inch uh, shots is now re-rolling. So those twos and ones that you're re-rolling because the bad moon's not on on first turn, now becoming a little bit more steady coming through for it. Um, you, you're 
have two attacks, fours and threes, neg one. Most of these guys actually have neg one to their attacks, so they're, they're not a bad thing having when you're getting in desperate situations or even because they don't have to be within each other's range, they can move out um, as objective markers and transportation models. Uh, as you said, hand of mock in late, uh, hand of uh, Gork in late game, moving small units to capture objectives and, and drawing people away from elements you want um, can be a massive thing. And people will look at this and go, okay, well, He's over there, but he's not allowing uh, that uh, Loom Plus with, um, with Mangala Squig, uh, re-rolling his attacks. So, and the attacks are shooting in combat. It just says all attacks re-rolling. So yeah. instead of going, is it worth to dedicate a unit of uh, 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 from my army to move over and deal with that or just leave it to cap that objective and I'll get through later. It, it's surprisingly quick on the how you can count up and tick these people through. Um, Spiker, uh, this guy only has one attack, uh, fours and three doing D3 uh, wounds going up there, three wounds, uh, six plus. Um, again, three plus, select a unit within it. This guy's 18 uh, inches again. Um, holy within 18 inches, you can reroll wound rolls of one in the hero phase. So uh, you put it on the hero phase. Now that unit that you've just of uh, 60 uh, 60 uh, grots, um, who you've sp uh, you have already planned in your head to spend the command point, so they're doing mortal wounds on wound rolls of sixes. You've used the sneaky yeah. snufflers. You've used your your small just... spider fanatics. Hopefully they're on like five attacks or four attacks. They're on attacks. some type you, you... of minimum three attacks. Rerolling once to wound, rerolling once to hit, mortal wounds on sixes to wound, um, you, maybe even rerolling, maybe even rerolling all to hit, um, but off the brigade. Um, no, brigade only heroes, heroes, as I said. Oh, it's a hero one. Oh. Yeah. So you, you you can't do the units for the all hit, but I'll be honest, as I said, Scargrot with his staff, which doing yeah, one mortal wound at the end, kicking off there, or even the. Um, the loom boss with mangler skick i was gonna 14 inch shits i was literally yeah. about to ask you uh i just I, I couldn't remember the keyword if he had the the moon clan grot keyword i thought he did um uh, but that he, you know re-rolling all hits uh would be would be beautiful uh I've seen so there's, beauty. yeah so there's a lot of interesting ones going uh, that you can use on those ones for your heroes and because they're not Massive output damages, but the loom boss with Mangler Squig. Uh, sorry, not with Mangler Squig. With Squig. It, it, no, normal one with the, uh, with squig, on, the one with on the, the poker. Squig, the, the cave Squig. Yeah, you're rerolling the. Uh, no, not Mangler. Rerolling the shooting attacks for him, which is sitting behind there, and also rerolling the Squig, which is the neg one with three damage, four attacks, fours and fours. He he becomes a quite um, legitimately. Um, strong combat person when you're re-rolling his attacks when you have two units uh, two rows of grots in front of him because of his range i tell you who i'd love to put that uh that re-roll on a trogoth hag um hasn't got the grot keyword oh is it a grot keyword what? one no nah. yeah 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 so it's um but because we've gone over that we're talking about the re-roll ones the next one the boggle eye so this is um this is by the way. Uh, while, what, while Luke like, looks it up, people on the podcast, I was shaking my fist because uh, <laughs> I, for a brief second I was just thinking hero. I'm like, yay, Trogoth princess, but no, it's yeah. it's Moon Clan. It's a it's a uh, the keyword of the um, of the Moon Clan grot, Moon which Clan. the Trogoth princess does not have. <laughs> oh, if she did, that would be oh absolutely crazy. What you could do oh with that? My gosh, her vomit, <laughs> her vomit alone. Like re-rolling those vomit attacks. Um, by well, the you know her. Yeah, no, uh, I'm actually not going to do boggle eye. I'm going to go shroom mancer just because we're talking about her. You know her amazing spell. Yeah. Yeah. Guess who has that? No. Shroom mancer. So, so, so Trogoth princess. Tr Trogoth princess uh, has. Uh, she is beautiful. Just amazing human being troll. Uh, but for the people who might not have looked at this Forge World model, they, by the way, you're like, where where is this in my battle tome? It is a Forge World model. It is uh, it's fully legitimate. Uh, love this model. If you watch the sh the show that I did with Stuart, uh, the Trog Boss, we talked a lot about the Trogoth Princess. But tell me about the spell that uh, I, I love this spell. Uh, so it's short range. It's short range, but it's, it's shorter range. It's so good. It's 
it's eight inch range going up for it. Um, it's also got a different key uh, name of the spell. It's the exact same spell, but different naming. Um, so you can actually have both of them in an army and cast both of them on the same unit. Oh, look at that. Look at the beard stroke when I've got your thoughts going up here. So you select a unit going in there. It's casting value of six. I actually think hers is seven. Is hers seven or six as I well? I think it's seven. I think it's seven. Well, this is six, so one less than going up there eh, to casting. Select a unit holy eh, eh, within, uh, no, just within eight, not holy, just within eight. This is one of the ones that are not holy. Um, negative one to their hits and negative one to their armor saves. So you have both of them stacking up when you already have the troll princess in there. You're now having negative one hits to their rolls. So not their armor save, but their rolls, which means it still affects the ethereal. And if people if people were wondering at the start of the show and, the, and we were laughing about minus two, minus three, minus four to hit, oh, it this is, is an so example, easy. right? We've got a Netta. Then we've got the Fungoid Cloud from the Shroom Mancer. Then we've also got the uh, the Moonface Moment. Um, all of a sudden we're getting all these different stacks to either minuses to save or minuses to hit. You know, then we add um, all these other different spells and different, you know, hell, put in Geminids. There's another minus one to hit. Um <laughs> It's very, yeah. very easy. To, uh, the artifact as well, the, is it the Clammy Cow that does? No, not Clammy Cow. Yep, Clammy yeah, Cow. Clemmy, Clemmy Cow. Negative one Minus to hit. One. So, again, all of a sudden you're just getting this absolute stacking uh, of, of negatives to hit. And that's that's kind of what we have to do against elites. We we we, we are small, itty, itty bitty grots that are not used to uh, versing against Sigmar's finest. Having the the buffs for their negative to hit and making them so those three pluses are now six pluses is how your unit of 60 grots stay alive. Um, it's how you deal with shooting because a lot of these uh, keywords in it is not saying against melee attacks. It's just saying negative one. Um, again, though, you know, sh uh, the Shroomancer's spell for the a fungoid cloud, it's only eight inches. Princess is also eight inches. But when you're having a four plus save turning into a six or a two plus save turning into a four against an enemy, when you don't have a lot of rend in your army, it makes a massive difference. Um, and he's not a slouch in combat too. He has a two inch range, two attacks, fours, fours, neg one, D three. Um, but he also has a dispel. So he has a cast, one cast, one dispel. He, he unfortunately isn't enough of a wizard to be allowed to get anything from the, um, the law, uh, the law, uh, neither is the bogle eye, but honestly for a dispel and a casting that, who cares? An extra dispel in your army, especially as we move into stronger magic armies, it, it, it's it's going to be needed. It, it's going to be um, something where I, I don't I don't feel that having bursting an army that's going to have six casters in there is is not out of the realm of possibility very shortly. Um, or when you have like a going against a slam that's casting so many spells, it, it, having one or two units that uh, just don't even have the hero keyword but still can do that to spell becomes very um, nice later on. Um, and then we go to the Bogolai. Um So another caster like going spell. out there. Oh, like he's, his, his oh it is absolutely amazing, especially when you know you have somebody else have, having Nicked Nicked, um, when you have no enemies around you and you have your only your own boys close. So before we go into it, we'll describe the spell going out for it. Um, Mesmerize, select a unit wholly within 12 inches, friend or foe. If you select a friend one, that unit becomes battle shock immune. So again, you're flinging that 60 grots down the other side of the board that are now re-rolling charge rolls, uh, re-rolling wound rolls of one and a battle shock immune until your next hero face. Um, yeah. that's great great 60... for protecting against the double turn, right? Like that, they're, they're just going to keep that. Keep, and you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about command points. You don't have to worry about them breaking... Um, and that's this is wonderful versatility. This is what the um, this is what I feel that the um, that the whole Gobblepalooza does. It saves you on command points. Um, it, and sure, some games you will have heaps of command points for grots. Other times, you know what? You got ten grot. Uh, you got ten um, command points. Spend that command point to make the sixties re-roll save rolls of one. Are you going to save a lot of grots? No, but you might save two or three. Re-roll the bad moons off the field. Re-roll. Uh, spend that command point to go all out attack because you've got your loon boss hiding around that sixty. So you're re-rolling that hit rolls of one. Um, 
and these guys are saving you for turn three and turn um, four to where those command points now become the difference between you holding that objective and you running away. Um, and because you also have that Loon Shrine coming back, that 60 that's gone, those 30 come through from the back of the Loon Shrine on that four plus, these boys can still buff those boys up. They can still help out and get them up there closer where they need to go. Um, See, I, I, look, I look at these rules a little bit different to you. Um, not that I disagree with you, but I no, look at them no. a little bit differently. The way I'm looking at these is that often for a lot of these things, like re-roll ones to hit, for example, right, that's happening at the start of a combat phase or it's happening at the you know, inspiring presence is happening at the start of the battle shock phase. This you is are hero phase where you can plan. Co correct. You are guaranteeing a hero phase activity that – should you get to combat, should you get to battle shock and realize that you are outside of your six inch inspiring presence, you're outside of your 12 inch, you know, whatever the rule might be, um, you've essentially guaranteed a move and you can now teleport with the hand of Gork. You can now run up the board. You can now release those fanatics knowing you've got a little bit more certainty than you would normally have. And then 100%. if you're, if you're, if you have a hero and you have the command points, you can do even more stuff, right? Now they're Battleshock immune and they're rerolling ones to hit. So this is um, where we were talking about too, the Realm of Shadow going out for their command ability. So you transport a Loon boss halfway up the field, um, then you run, uh, uh, then you uh, walk your grots up or even run if you really have to, and then you can redeploy them out, out in front of you and you have your hero guaranteeing those reroller ones and those mortal wounds while having that bulk world ready for a turn two that's not going to go against your favor we briefly talked but, about that but that's but that's only happening if you play the realm of all realm, yeah. so, so, um, so, 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 so it's not like your if your army comes from the realm of shadow you yeah, don't, don't get those get rules it is only when you choose to play in the realm of shadow so it, uh if, if you just if you are playing match play and you do get the choice that is a nice choice to choose from but it's not a reason to choose your army coming from the realm of shadows, no, just no, to separate no, no. The, the two. Yes, uh, 100%. Um, but I, I feel that the way Games Workshop, um, and maybe this is just me, simplified those rules was to try to get them into more tournaments and try to get people to start doing each round as a different uh, realm going through there. I think uh, tournaments I feel... are gonna choose, to be honest. I think I think as a tournament organiser, I'm not going to let you guys choose. I think I'm going to decide... <laughs> Each round, the whole, the whole, each either the whole uh, whole weekend is in Ulgu or, you know, round three is in Akshi, round four is in, you know, you know whatever, you know, Shimon. Each round. Um, well, that, but, that's, that's what I've seen a couple of the, you know, one day is up here, round one is done, this realm, round two is done that. And I've, it seems to be going pretty well. Got kicked a bit hard <laughs> on some of the I, realms. I, I guess I, I guess I only say this just so people aren't building a strategy around. Oh, I'm going to choose my army from all goo. They're going to do this. I'm going to do this, and then realize that it doesn't work on the table because it's based on the realm that you're playing in. But it's no. a good. It's a, it's a really good tip. It's a really great tip, actually. Uh, if you get to play in all goo. No, hundred hundred uh, percent. Yes. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. Play. No, no, just 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 in case. Like, I'm, I'm always very conscious of the newer player who might not know all of the rules. And I think anyone who who who's comfortable with the rules knew what you were saying. But in the off chance, they're like, "Oh, I'm going to pick Ulgu as my army," and no, it doesn't quite work the way that you might think it's going to work. Um, yeah. So these boys are all about synergy. Um, what what the difficulty with these boys is uh, is keeping in your mind at the beginning of the hero where you're moving to the beginning of the next hero phase because once you're in the hero phase already this is where you're going you're moving these guys for the next hero phase um when you're moving them you're preparing for these guys abilities go off there um as you said earlier moon clan grots it's all about synergy it's all about um pulling yourself forward and thinking about the next turn and the next move before you even have to start doing it because if, if you're out, a lot of things are wholly within. Some things are uh, uh, don't, but most of our stuff in our book is wholly within and trying to manoeuvre your um, grots within range. Um, the best thing I can kind of say is always give yourself an inch leeway with whatever you're doing with grots. Uh, the worst thing you want to do is pull yourself out with a pile in and realise that, oh, shit, next turn... Uh, if I don't double turn, I'm not going to be able to use um, my 
boom rolls of six mortal wounds from my loom boss and it will happen it, it, it you roll with the punches you you uh put yourself in a yeah. position where you're like yeah this is gonna go great and then I've done that like, many Ooh. times. I've done that many times with the uh, the overzealous piling and <laughs> wrapping around, and then I'm 14 inches or 13 inches, and it's that one or two that has stopped me from doing mortal wounds, which is part of the strategy that I built around investing so many points in the snufflers and the loon smasher, uh, the, the spore splatters and that. So uh, always, and and I, I guess I'm going to ask you a, a question. This probably is a nice segue before 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 I segue. Is there anything else you'd ask? you'd mentioned about the Gobapalooza? Um, don't be afraid to split them up, um, even when you're using the battalion points. And the battalion, it's a lot of points for the battalion. Like, um, it, it cool, you get a free command point, you get a free artifact, but it is a heavy investment. If you're going to run Gobapalooza and you want the battalion points, you really got to think of how you design it's, your list. It's almost battalion. 300 points, isn't it? Like, when you start putting the battalion together, it gets close to 300 where it's just like... <laughs> That's a loon smash. That's, 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 that's a, a magla squig. And that's that's a lot, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I take these boys a lot, and I do take magla squigs a lot too. Generally, I have one in both of my lists going up there. But if you're running a grot heavy list, these guys will work harder for you than a magla squig. It yeah. may not take a more crusher out, but you can guarantee your 60 boys with the extra attacks and the re-rolls and the battle shock immunity are going to last a hell of a lot longer and do a hell of a lot more damage in the long run than a mangler squig will. I agree. I, 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 I wholly agree. And I think this is where I, I really wanted to talk to you as well, being uh, not only someone who's very proficient with grots, but also someone who's proficient with the uh, the gobapalooza. Again, probably something that's underestimated because a lot of people aren't using it. I didn't like it at first glance. I think because I looked at the battalion and I was just, I was, I didn't, I didn't take it because it wasn't the rules. It was just, it was too many points for what I, what I, what I was seeing. And I thought I had a better investment with points. Now that I can't take six or seven endless spells. Now that I can't buff up my army with all, all these wizards. Now I'm rethinking about how I do it. And I think the way that you're, you're showing off with additional loon bosses, with things like the Palooza, I think that this is now the smart way to move this army forward in the new meta. The yep, yeah, 100%. I think this is the right build. I think in the new meta, this is the right build. Um, and for anyone who's looking at their gits, they probably have to pull back to the endless spells. Anyone like me has probably just gained an extra 100, 200 points because I, I can't take set. I was literally taking six to seven endless spells. Well, it, it, a lot of a lot of grot players were, and you know what? It wasn't a bad call doing it. Um, I, I I remember um, what was it? First time I took out a destruction uh, a best destruction player up here in Queensland. The boards lighted up. Yeah, I was running the Gobba Palooza, but it was mainly because I only had one endless spell, and everyone was like, "He only had one endless spell, and he yeah. had Gobba Palooza." What? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, it's a bit. It was like, it's a bit it was odd. Fun. I got. I was running Palisade, Geminids, Swords, uh, you know, Spiders. Like, this is literally everything. But this is not the Spider. This is, this is not Anthony talking about Endless Spells. This is Luke talking about Gits. Luke, the final question I've got for you, and we'll kind of wrap this up, is what have you learnt about playing with Gits that, that you wouldn't have known when you very first started? You know, from your experience, from your tactics, from your interactions with your opponents, what have you learnt now that someone who's picking up the book for the first time is going to have to learn the hard way, but now you're going to tell us what 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 to do and what not to do. Timing, synergy, and timing is everything in this list. Um, the end. Oh, look, I, I, I played. I, I like you was playing Moon Clan before it went into uh, before it's turned into this new battle tone going up there, and um, timing and synergy was not as big. It was very, very much, you know, the old Kangal uh, fungaloid shaman when it used to allow you to run and charge was fantastic going out there. But you didn't have to synergize everything. You didn't have to have your timing. A lot of destruction um, players, it smash them up, heavy hitters go into it. And this is a very different destruction army than pretty much anything else out there. And oh, look, I, I play a lot of destruction. I love playing destruction. It's crazy. Um, but with this one, especially when you're doing grots, everything measure twice, 
think where your where you want your stuff to be next turn because you can't rely on anything else in your army except for your synergies. And even then, <laughs> everything's so random. So it's all about timing and choosing when to hit, when to strike. Any that's other tips? Pretty- I've got a couple of tips, but I want to see if you've got any other tips. Um, that's my broader ones going up there. Uh, experiment is always a good one. But uh, as I said earlier, you know, measuring out where your loon shrine goes so you know where your half port, uh, port of your board because um, knowing what's fully under the moon uh, makes a big difference because you don't want to get caught out on that one. So having your loon shrine or at least your range of it, I try to put one of my gobba palooza right on the midsection board because you're always going to go the crossways because that's how the boards are pretty much done. You, you'll always be able to figure that out. But because, especially if you're playing the tile ones, that board being cut in half the middle, when you have to measure it out, when your opponent goes, let's just double check if you're under the moon, having your one model already sitting on that guideline for you can make a world of difference for effectiveness. Yeah. Um, don't don't get disheartened when um, the moon doesn't come on the field. Don't... Uh, <laughs> When you're playing three turns and the moon still doesn't go on the field, you kind of feel like, well, maybe I am crazy for playing this army. Um, the worst is when you got Scrag right and you're like, oh, I rolled the one. <laughs> the, the chance of rolling Why another did- one, the, the chance of rolling another one is is so low, and I don't want to burn a command point yet. Uh, I'm going to roll it, and you roll another one, and then you're like, shit, okay, I I've rolled two ones. Command point, no, 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 but then you're like, I, ro- I rolled two turn. ones. No, I'm not going to roll another one and you roll another one. And then you're just like, you're like. <sighs> no, 110%. Another good one is don't be afraid to spend command points or, or stack up on do your, uh, do your four or five heroes with low points just so you can spend off some of those command points. Um, re-rolling ones when you have a five plus armor save, people look at you and you're like, is it really worth it? But yeah, it, look, saving five grots is saving five grots. And it can be surprisingly, especially when you have something that does D3 damage against a Grot, it can stack up pretty well. Having that one or two saves against it can really make a difference in the long run. Um, well, it's better than having 12 command points at the end of the game that you just haven't burnt. <laughs> so so it makes sense to use them. Um, obviously, don't burn them for the sake of burning them, but don't be conservative because you have the highest amount of CP generation in the game. I don't think there's anyone, even without a battalion, right? The fungi does one, the uh, the the uh, um, scrag rut does D3. You get additional ones for being under the light of the bad moon. You get an additional one for the start of the battle round. Get some for the battalion. All of a sudden, it is so easy to get 10 or more CP and keep spending them, and you will – don't be afraid. Exactly. Um there's don't be afraid to throw the moon in the opposition's um, court at the beginning of the game. Um, just be smart when you're doing it. If you do it for a reason, if you're doing it because you, you intend to go over that way to use the bad moon in turn two, do it. If you're doing it because you know they have a big sp- a spell caster, I see Nagash and I go, cool, moon in the back corner over there. I, uh, it, it, just, just to play head games with them at the very least. <laughs> I think they do some um, chip damage as well, which is helpful, yeah. but the minus one to cast, it can be the difference between them casting and not casting that one. So it, it, it is, it can really, really be that. And it's surprising how often that happens, especially when you throw a few damage onto a, uh, onto your stack heroes. Um, it, there's, there's a lot of, I, I don't think we've really dug out everything that uh, the Grotz has to do for it. I, I feel there is so many different tools in this list that the the Grot book will be able to help you long into the future. Um, even when the next meta chains or the next two meta changes, I feel that there's still going to be great items that we can pull up and new strategies that come through. Um, I mean, we haven't we haven't t- I'm probably going to bring this home. We haven't really talked about introducing trogoths into Grots. We haven't talked about squigs and grots. We haven't talked about spiders and grots. Um, and then you have combinations like trogs and spiders, squigs and spiders, spiders and trogs, <laughs> spiders and squigs. So there is a lot of synergies and there's a lot of play styles you can introduce. Hell, there's gargants as well. We we have the ale guzzler gargant as well in this army. So 
Then you've got Forge World. You've got you know the Colossal Squig, the Mangler Squig. So it's a Colossal Squig. You've got the Squig Gobber. You've got the um, the Rogue Idol. You know for for a spell casting um, gets on. Oh, no, there is an ally. No, it is an ally. It is unfortunately and, 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 an ally, and it's, now, and it's now too expensive. It went up slightly that you can't bring Dude. it in. But but you've you still have the Troll Hag. You've got a whole bunch of stuff. The Bone Grinder Gargan. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do to bring into this army, and it'll always keep you interested. But it, it hundred percent is going up there, and um, yeah, it was kind of a little bit of a kick in the teeth. I've, I've got two my war clans over there of the rogue idols and there was nothing better than throwing a rogue idol to add one plus to your casting and bravery for your boys go, yeah, going through um kind of kind of a little bit sad when they put the points up for that but it, it kind of deserved it it was too good in uh in war clans not but for kids in, though not for not for us like no, it's no. nice but it was never never that amazing a small uh, bracket saying just forget players <laughs> I think so. Yeah. And the last the last piece of advice I would add, because Luke's added basically everything I would have said, um, the synergies, the – the um, I think the big thing as well is um, when I was playing with Gits, the, there's a lot of rules to remember. So I'm going to give a shout-out to AOS Reminders um, as you're learning the army because there's also a lot of nuances that happen at the start of a phase, at the end of a phase. It happens before the battle round. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of different rules. So if you're learning this army and you're getting overwhelmed, especially the gits more than ever, that build has a lot of rules and a lot of synergies. AOS Reminders is a free website to bring your rules into one page. Um, super helpful. Uh, it's very helpful rule. So you, if nothing more, as a checklist so you know that you've done everything that you need to do. No, look, that is absolutely 110% player. If gits is your first army in, in, going into AOS, that... <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, look, look as, as as much as I want to welcome new hobbyists to this army, I don't think it is a new person friendly army. Um, it's, and it's crazy how many new players I have uh, just in my local area that, and they go for um, squigs. Oh, and squigs are they, different. Squigs are different. Squigs are squigs. Are, yeah. But the, the grot, the grot. But they get like two or three squigs and then go, oh, I, I see what you're doing. I want to do <laughs> what you're doing and start trying to transition. And you're like, oh, okay, okay, let, let me be there for you. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a tough learning curve. Um, it is a tough no. learning curve. You you will do things that uh, it is very much you're killing your opponent with a scalpel, not with a sledgehammer. So if you want to play sledgehammers, you're playing with iron jaws. If you want to, you know, stab them a lot, uh, and you want to just annoy the crap out of them, uh, Git is for you. And um, the whole difference between uh, brutally cunning and cunningly brutal. Luke, any shout outs, anything you want to say before we kind of bring this home? Uh, to my beautiful fiance, Evie, uh, who's no doubt watching, laughing, and jeering and poking fun at me on whatever chats that's coming up, we're going over it. Um, the massive amount of uh, scene that we have in Brisbane and the Toowoomba, the guys up from the failed charge, they're always amazing. Uh, um, Mick, Gemma and the rest of them, Jesus, they give their heart and soul to the whole community of Queensland, honestly. Clint's, um, Clint's in Toowoomba as well. Don't, don't forget Clint. Oh, oh mate, I've, I've helped Clint, Clint set up. <laughs> Cliff, Clint. Cliff and Clint going out there. Um, the, there's – sorry, hold on. Um, I, I'm being yelled at for something. Let's ignore that for two seconds. I hope it didn't come through. Um, uh, definitely Clint and Cliff going up there. Uh, I always love going to CanCon and helping set it up down there. He he runs the best tournament going out there. It will Second arguably best. the best tournament. Second best. Uh, I, I run the I, best. I haven't been able to get down to you, especially uh, at the moment going up there. We, me and Evie were planning coming down to your tournament. I've got, got two next year. I'm running two next year. I'm running a amazing narrative event and a grand tournament. So, uh, I've actually Anvil's really cool for Anvil's one. apotheosis. Uh, it's it's pretty crazy. You're all fighting over the beast grave, but this. So, Luke, uh, one more going up for it. The the man, the legend, uh, going for for it. Uh, Gabe. Um, <laughs> Look at that face going up there and all the boys from the Mango Mafia. 
Um, look, they're, they're, this is an amazing area to live in uh, and playing AOS. We have so many great people in there, um, you know, and, and we've got Corey. So <laughs> we've got right, some amazing I, people and we've got right, Corey. I'm going to have to end this show. Like, like enough of the Queensland love. As soon as you talked about the mangoes, like, no, like, <laughs> don't encourage them. Don't encourage the mango mafia. Don't encourage Toowoomba. No, Queensland has an amazing scene. Uh, that's why I love travelling up there. You guys are awesome. I hopefully get to Bruce Hammer this year, uh, assuming the borders are reopened. But um, Luke, Evie, uh, this is an awesome show. Evie, thank you for letting me have Luke for two odd hours two and a half hours, actually. This is the longest talking Sorry. video that I've done. But I think it is complementary to the um, to to the, the nuances and the style of it. If you listen to the duration of this podcast or this video, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you uh, stayed along with us the whole show. Uh, there was a beeping battery or something that was super annoying, but it was only happening once every minute. But uh, I didn't want to say anything. Hopefully no nobody noticed it. That's what you was just telling me. Hey, there's a beep coming on. In the yeah, it's background. been for two and a half hours. Uh, I, if you haven't noticed it, and the folks at home hadn't noticed it, we're all good. If you had noticed it, I apologize, Luke. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. This is a great discussion. Uh, go kids. <laughs> go kids. Go kids. See, you, folks. Bye. Good day. I hope you enjoyed that video, and you're left with some new ideas. One of the biggest ways you can contribute to AOS Coach is by liking the video you just watched and leaving a comment in the comment section. This lets YouTube know this is a good video and it should recommend it to other hobbyists. If you'd also like to support the channel even further like these bloody legends, go check out AOS Coach on Patreon. Otherwise, don't forget your triumph.